So hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I know it's been quite a long time, but I am back with a great story that I stumbled upon and liked instantly. I am pretty sure this story is gonna make up for all the time I have been away. This is a story about being reborn into the Uchiha clan, part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want next part of this video, comment down below to let me know. And before I start, please do support for more awesome contents, and leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And share this video with your friends, and also check out the descriptions and check out the playlists. With that out of the way, let's start. Chapter 1, Rebirth I wasn't sure exactly when I became aware. It wasn't sudden like waking up. It was more like dreaming. My sense of touch came first, my face, my lips, my nose. Then I felt other things, like a body but not. I couldn't move. I slept, I think. I wasn't sure how much time passed or even if time was passing at all. I was aware and not. I existed. Maybe. I had fingers. When did that happen? I flexed my hand, the movement ungainly and awkward. I had feet too. I kicked once, just to test the muscles, but the movement was hindered, like I was in a thick, elastic bag. I slept. There was warmth or maybe sound. But not. It wasn't heat exactly, but that was the closest comparison I could make. It was all around me, like a curtain of white noise. And it was inside me. It ebbed and flowed like water, and I found that if I paid particular attention, I could move it back and forth. It was like a game, pushing and pulling the warmth from my chest into my toes. But it was also tiring. I was so tired. I slept. I could move more easily. I kicked and reached out often, seeking anything in the dark. But there was nothing. I settled back eventually. And I slept. And then I was awake. The warmth, which had, up until this point, been a pleasant stream, surged like a burst dam, the sudden violence nearly scalding me. I reached out for nothing, the warmth crackling like fire, like lightning all around me. Agitated. No, terrified. I kicked. But the warmth still pulsed and crackled. It no longer flowed into me in a steady stream. No, it flowed around me. And I was suddenly tired. So, so tired. I slept. I was cold. I had eyes. Of course I had eyes. But something was wrong. Everything was blurry. Why had it taken so long to remember that I could see? And why had I never thought to open them while in the place with the warmth? There was warmth here too, but it was different, not like the comforting warmth that flowed into my belly. This was different, alien. It flowed into my arms and neck. It felt strange. Unnatural. My muscles were weird too. I'd been flexing my limbs and kicking, but in the warm place there had been no up or down, as if gravity had no hold over me. Here, though. Here was different. I couldn't even lift my head. I tried to call out, but my lips were too puffy and my tongue was unwieldy in my mouth. Somewhere, a baby cried. I slept. When I woke, there were giants around me, monolithic things whose shapes I could barely make out. They were able to pick me up and carry me around as if I weighed nothing. I cried out in terror, but again all I heard was the screaming of a baby. I stopped to listen, and so did the baby. Then it finally, finally clicked. After one minor panic attack and one major existential crisis, my next priority was figuring out where exactly I'd been reborn. It wasn't easy since my infant body wanted nothing beyond food, sleep, and warm cuddles, which made it hard to focus on anything long enough to really think about it. I gathered that something must have gone wrong in the womb, because I was housed in an incubator. There were several IVs attached to my arms and neck to provide nutrients. I was also vaguely aware of the giants, adults, that came and went. 
and with each passing day my vision grew clearer until I could recognize faces. Most of the adults had obvious nursing uniforms, and all were of Asian descent, though many came with wild technicolor hair. Despite the rotating caste, there was a small group of people that came to visit me regularly in those first few weeks. They were obviously a family, a mother and father and their two children. They had classic Japanese features including dark hair and eyes along with pale skin. The woman was youngish, perhaps mid-twenties, and pretty with a kind, sad smile. She was always carrying a small bundle, a baby. The other child was also young, perhaps four or five. He had shoulder-length black hair and wide, intelligent eyes that tracked my smallest movement with attentive curiosity. The man was older and stone-faced when he looked down at me. After just over a month in the hospital, they were the ones to come and collect me. Life outside the incubator was, difficult. As a baby, I didn't have a lot of mobility. When I tried to lift my head, I found that I didn't have the strength. When I tried to move my arms, they flailed around like limp noodles. When I tried to speak, my tongue remained infuriatingly unresponsive. I was left with no way to move or communicate beyond crying, which my pride wouldn't allow unless I was truly desperate. I was left with long hours of sleeping and boredom, though it did allow me to observe the world around me. Oddly, the warmth I'd noticed in the womb wasn't just inside me. It was inside everyone. When someone entered my room, I could sense them before I could see or hear them. The sense was dim, like feeling the warmth from a candle, but if I concentrated, I could feel their warmth and the way it flowed through their bodies. If I concentrated really, really hard, I could even sense them in the hallways and downstairs, but the feeling was so faint that it might have been my imagination. I wasn't able to experiment too much, as it inevitably left me exhausted. When I wasn't napping or trying to get comfortable in my new body, I was carefully listening to the words spoken around me, desperately trying to pick up sounds and string them together into something resembling a coherent word or sentence. My brain, still technically that of a baby, was like a sponge soaking up everything. My parents weren't actively trying to teach me anything yet, though the man sometimes said to Yu Chen. Daddy slowly and with exaggerated mouth movements. I tried to mimic him, but the closest I could get was ha-ha. And that was little more than a pair of sharp exhalations. The woman tried with Kaya Chen. Mommy. But the best I could do was a ha-ha. Despite the failed attempt, she beamed and said something to the man, who smiled, a sharp contrast to his normally stoic expression. I shared a nursery with the other baby, who turned out to be a boy. And, if my guess was correct, his name was Suzuki. The older boy was named Itaki, which was weird, but I supposed there were people who got really into anime, a fact which was verified when I noticed the Uchiha fan on the boy's back. Apparently they were really into cosplay too, but there were worse fates, I supposed. I also picked up on my name, which was apparently Kiyo. Itaki had his own room down the hall, but he almost always gravitated to our room to play or take us out to the back garden, which proved to be somewhat hazardous. I hadn't even been out of the hospital for a week when I caught a cold and was placed right back into it again. My family left me there overnight for observation. And that's where I was when it happened. I jolted awake, shrieking at the nightmare, at the roaring monster whose anger cut through me like a knife, drowning me in raw terror. But as I flailed around, dizzyingly awake in a way I hadn't been since my rebirth, the nightmare did not fade. The roars grew louder, and there were crashing sounds and screaming coming from outside. My shriek cut off as I froze helplessly in my crib. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't even think. All I could do was lay there and wait to die. Eventually the terrifying presence vanished, gone so completely that it might have been a dream if it weren't for the lingering sense of dread hanging in the air like a thick fog. I waited there all night, still and quiet and alone until a nurse came by to check on me. She was frazzled, her wide eyes sweeping over me once before nodding and rushing out. 
Her white uniform, normally pristine, was speckled with reddish brown. I was very, very quiet. With daylight came my mother and brothers. She looked over me with anxious eyes and patted my small tuft of hair. Itaki also looked relieved, and he poked my cheek gently by way of greeting. I whimpered, the first sound I'd made since it happened, and he looked sad. They came to visit me every day for my two-week hospital stay until my cold cleared up and the nurses sent me home. Itaka took me and little Suzuki for a walk among heavily laden wagons being driven by oxen through the streets toward some unknown location. That alone sent alarm bells ringing in my head. Who used oxen in this day and age? But that wasn't the only thing I noticed now that I finally had a chance to look around. The buildings were strange, all curves and odd angles with graffiti and posters slapped in the most inaccessible places. It was as if the builders had only passing familiarity with architecture styles and many of them looked like they were still standing by the power of hopes and dreams. My confusion bled to worry, but it wasn't until Itaki rounded a corner and the Hokage monument came into view that the truth reared up and smacked me across the face. Oh, oh no. I had been reborn into the world of Naruto. Into the Uchiha clan. Before the massacre. And I was completely. Utterly. Perfectly. Screwed. Chapter 2, In Sickness and Health. There were certain advantages to knowing exactly when and how you were going to die. I'd spent my entire previous life preparing for the inevitable tomorrow, often sacrificing today in the process. But all of my hard work, my preparations, everything I'd ever done or wanted or hoped to one day be had been erased in a single moment. I'd already daydreamed about building my new life in this world, plotting out everything and not making the same mistakes I had last time. But apparently that was unnecessary, as I wouldn't live long enough to make the same mistakes anyway. It was a kick to the teeth, sure, but it was also a workable deadline, a reminder that I still had today, and that I could still make the most of it despite, well, everything. I admit that I had a few brief, very brief, fantasies of swooping in and righting the wrongs of this world, of preventing the massacre, befriending Naruto, and saving everyone. But when I tried to work out exactly how to do that, things started to fall apart rather rapidly. The massacre hadn't been Itaka's fault. It was the result of a complicated web of slights, suspicions, and fear that had ultimately culminated in the death of the entire clan. Events had been set it in motion before Kanaha's founding with the feud between the Uchiha and the Senju. I couldn't change the past. I couldn't prevent the suspicion or the surveillance. And with those things in place, I couldn't change the clan's collective minds. I could see it all laid out before me in its horrible inevitability. And I thought that maybe the rest of the clan could see it too. Maybe they'd never wanted to fight, but they were afraid that suspicion would bloom into fear, and that fear would lead to their annihilation. They weren't wrong. So that was it. Stopping Itaka wouldn't stop Danzo or Fugaku. And stopping Danzo from killing Shisui would only be a temporary measure before things boiled over again as suspicion and fear continued to grow unchecked. As I lay beside Suzuki in his crib, I came to the reluctant conclusion that I was truly powerless to change his fate. And, for several of the same reasons, I highly doubted that I would be able to help Naruto either. Even assuming that I had seven or eight years to work with, I doubted anyone would allow an Uchiha child near the village Jinhuraki, not after what had just happened. If I sought him out, if I tried to befriend him while supposedly knowing nothing about him, what would that look like to the villagers? It would look like I was trying to get access to the Kuabai. If the village elders didn't stop me, my clan certainly would. They couldn't afford more suspicion, certainly not when they were actually up to something. As for everything else, what use would I be against the Akatsuki, let alone against Obito, Madara, and Kagaya? Despite the manga's emphasis on the power of hard work, the two main heroes were reincarnated near gods with the power of a Baijuyu and an eternal Manjikyo Sherinan slash Rinnegan combo. Even the cage fell well short of Naruto and Suzuki's strength and had done little to change the outcome of the final battles. 
the only thing I had to offer was information, but who would believe a child? What did it matter when I would be long dead by the time these enemies appeared? It didn't. I didn't matter at all. I was just another background character sacrificed during the hero's origin story. But that, in a way, was freeing. I didn't matter. Nothing I did mattered. So I could do anything I wanted with the time I was given. And I was a child too, so playing around, having fun, and decidedly not thinking about the future wouldn't even be that unusual. I wanted to get out and learn as much as I could in this magical, fantastical world, that currently consisted of a single room and a reincarnated demigod in diapers. As far as roommates went, Suzuki wasn't bad. He was a happy baby who got used to my presence soon enough and often cuddled up by my side to nap. He slept for most of the day and night, but he was always wide awake when Itaka came to visit. It didn't take long for me to realize that Itaki adored Suzuki. It was written in the way his face lit up when he looked at his younger brother, in the way he spoke softly to Suzuki and bounced Suzuki on his knee. And Suzuki adored Itaki right back, smiling when he arrived and crying when he had to leave. Itaki always laughed quietly at Suzuki's clinginess, poking Suzuki in the forehead when he had to go and saying sorry, Suzuki. Next time. Itaka was a kind and cheerful child, always smiling at Fugaku and Mikato. But with Suzuki, it was different. Itaki had latched onto him, a tiny and defenseless innocent that needed to be protected no matter what. No matter what, Itaka would protect Suzuki. It would have been easy to resent him for what he would do, but I didn't. He spent his days smiling, playing with Suzuki and me, and reading us books. He balanced Suzuki on one leg and me on the other, slowly tracing out the words in picture books and making exaggerated sounds as he read the stories. There was no malice in him, no anger, and no spite. He was just a little kid with his little brother and his little sister. No, I didn't hate him. I felt sorry for him. He was cursed by being a prodigy. And if I wasn't careful, I risked following in his footsteps. I didn't want any part of that fate and so I watched Suzuki, using him as the gold standard for what my progress should be. When he started rolling onto his belly, so did I. When he sat up, so did I. When he started crawling, so did I. It was good for maintaining my cover, but it didn't leave me much to stimulate my mind. Limited as my options were, I spent much of my waking time playing with the warmth I'd noticed before, which I supposed was my chakra. I attempted the leaf-sticking exercise with some success. I used whatever was in reach including my clothes and blankets and occasionally Suzuki, though I was careful never to mold chakra where anyone else might see. It was a good way to spend those early days, even if it was a little monotonous. All the while, I was carefully listening and doing my best to pick up on the local language. I was absorbing new words rapidly, and after a few months, I was able to follow entire conversations with relative ease. Eventually I gathered that Fugaku and Mikato weren't my actual parents. My father, Uchiha Siaki, was Fugaku's distant relative and had died during a mission almost six months ago. My mother, Uzumaki Ryoko, had died during childbirth. Apparently they'd had to induce labor five weeks early in an attempt to save us. They had saved me but my birth mother hadn't made it. Instead I'd been given to Mikato, the only Uchiha mother who was still nursing. She named me Uchiha Kiyo after an old pre-Kanaha ancestor, and she treated me as if I was her own. Mikato was a good mom, gentle and attentive, not even showing any obvious favoritism toward her actual child rather than the interloper who had been dropped unexpectedly into her lap. In fact, if anything, she seemed thrilled to have a little girl. While Mikato smiled and cooed at me, Fugaku remained rather stoic, rarely showing any obvious affection, though he did still smile at us occasionally. I could see why Suzuki would struggle to earn his praise in the future. I also noted the differences in their chakra. Fugaku was like a white hot blade that sharpened whenever he focused on something. 
Mikato was softer, like candlelight. Itaka was like a campfire, warm and inviting. And Suzuki, well, he was like the sparks from a piece of flint striking steel. Given time, I knew that those sparks would one day become an inferno. One day. I grew a little impatient waiting for Suzuki's first word, so I eventually bowed to boredom and beat him to it. Itaka was playing peekaboo with Suzuki and me, and Mikato came in to ask if he'd done his chores. Hi, he said. Yes. Hi. I echoed, figuring it was as good a first word as any. I clapped my hands and grinned. Hi. Hi. Mikato vanished, reappearing a moment later with Fugaku in tow, and I repeated my first word for him too. He smiled and commented about my early verbal skills. Suzuki was also smiling and laughing, not understanding the commotion but enjoying it anyway. I felt a brief flare of chakra and realized that Mikato had activated her sherry non. For a moment, I wondered if there was a threat nearby, but she was merely smiling down at me. Oh, well, I supposed that the sherry non was used to memorize things. So maybe this was the Uchiha version of a photograph, or maybe a home movie. I repeated my words a few more times, still smiling and clapping for her. It felt strangely heartwarming that there was someone here who cared enough about my first word to remember it. I saw her sherry non again a few more times like during birthdays or when she dressed us up for the New Year's festival. Soon enough Itaka began attending the academy, leaving Suzuki and me to our own devices for most of the day. It was pretty dull without him around, as Fugaku was always off at work and Mikato was running the house and various clan affairs by herself. She tried to make time for us, playing games and giving us toys, but there was an odd undercurrent to many of them. Several of the dolls were ninja-shaped with vital organs marked with large black XS that Mikato trained us to poke. The clapping games were filled with what looked like jutsu hand signs. And there were various targets around the room that she taught us to hit with beanbags. Then there were the stories she read to us. They were filled with great ninja, samurai, and rogue warriors fighting for clan and country. They tended to include a lot of fighting and death. And I mean a lot. Although the subject matter of the books was disconcerting, I focused on learning how to read, tracing the symbols and reading them back to her over and over again. When Mikato was busy, I toddled around with story books and held them up at anyone who made eye contact with me. Itaka was always willing to read, and Fugaku could be convinced with puppy dog eyes. Visiting family members and guests occasionally fell victim to my guilt trips if Mikato wasn't careful to keep the doors closed. Once when she was hosting a dinner party and had locked the dining room door, I even managed to escape the house and found a pair of old men playing shogi who readily obliged in reading to me. A harried Mikato burst out of the house an hour later and hauled me back inside, but I merely waved at the men with a happy bye-bye. Mikato, apparently deciding that I had far too much energy, started teaching Suzuki and me basic stretches and exercises to build muscle and flexibility. She turned it into another game, adding new movements regularly as we memorized the old ones. We also started doing stamina building, which I thought was a little strange considering our age, but maybe she just wanted to tire us out now that Itaka was away for most of the day. Stamina building consisted of running. Lots and lots of running. Suzuki and I were told to run laps around the backyard, taught things like push UPS, sit UPS, and lunges. We weren't quite two yet, so our stamina was virtually non-existent, but I was sure that a normal two-year-old from my previous world wouldn't have had the strength for most of this. I chalked it up to the chakra flowing through our bodies, strengthening muscles, and speeding reaction times far beyond what a normal human child should be able to accomplish. This was hampered greatly by my asthma, one of the side effects of my troubled birth. Dust and strenuous exercise were enough to leave me gasping for air, and Ninja apparently hadn't invented inhalers yet. It felt unfair that I was half Uzumaki and still suffered from health complications, but apparently I hadn't inherited the famous Uzumaki constitution. I probably shouldn't be too upset, though. 
bloodlines weren't a guarantee of perfect genetics. Traits could die out or skip a generation, like how Bruto wouldn't have a Byakugan even with Hinata as his mother. My physical limitations weren't enough to completely deter me, however. I went as far as I could go, and then I took breaks while Suzuki continued to train. Well train. We were still toddlers, after all. But I was a little surprised and unsettled by how early they were starting us down this path. The Uchiha really were ninjas straight out of the cradle. Less than a year into our training, Itaka graduated. We had a grand feast that night where most of the clan turned out to offer congratulations, more to Fugaku than Itaka, oddly. Suzuki and I were dressed in tiny blue kimonos and we were allowed to sit at the table beside Itaka, who seemed embarrassed by all the attention. I occasionally slipped sweets onto Itaka's plate, which he ate surreptitiously when no one was looking. Afterwards, Itaka started taking D-rank missions and training more often. When he played with us, he started using reflex games and even taught us a few throwing techniques with rubber balls. Suzuki and I managed to pick up some of the basics easily enough. Suzuki had far better aim, which didn't surprise me at all. In my former life, I'd never played sports because I was terrible at just about anything involving aim and coordination. My asthma only served to widen that gap further since I could only train for a fraction of the time, but that didn't bother me too much, as I wouldn't live long enough for those skills to be useful. Suzuki, on the other hand, ate up whatever Itaka was willing to teach and often spent hours upon hours practicing in the backyard. I wanna be like Nii-san. He said excitedly when he managed to hit the target for the third time in a row. Suzuki's verbal skills were coming along nicely. He was now at the point of speaking in complete, simple sentences, though I couldn't always understand what he was saying. I tended to be quieter to disguise the fact that my verbal skills were far beyond that of a normal toddler, but it meant that my pronunciation suffered from lack of practice, and Mikato often prodded me to speak more often and clearly. You will be, I assured him, throwing my ball. It went wide, just barely grazing the edge of the target. I frowned and tried again, missing the target entirely. No, like this, said Suzuki, showing me the stance Mikato had demonstrated a few weeks ago, taking a moment to aim, and throwing the ball in a perfect arc towards the center of the target. I did my best to mimic him, but I only managed to bounce off the outer ring. Suzuki shook his head. No, like this. Toddlers weren't the best teachers, but Suzuki had no problems showing me the stance and motions over and over again until I started hitting the target consistently. In fact, he seemed to enjoy being an authority on the subject. It was an easy, fun way to spend an autumn day. That winter I discovered that Kanaha did, in fact, get snow. We had an extremely temperate climate, and the previous winters had been cold and wet as far as I could recall, but this year we had actual bona fide snow. Sadly, I couldn't enjoy it because I was cooped up inside with pneumonia. I'd had on and off colds and infections for the past year. No one seemed particularly surprised by this. Apparently I'd been diagnosed with a weakened immune system in addition to my asthma. I'd been bundled up in a heavy blanket and planted under the kotetsu, a type of table with a blanket skirt and a heater. Mikato sat across from me mending Fugaku's torn uniform, Suzuki was outside training, Itaka was off on a mission, and Fugaku was at work. Coughing and sniffling, I worked my way through my picture books again, my eyes often straying to the window where I could see Suzuki playing. It looked like a lot of fun, more so than reading about the sounds made by barn animals. Kaachan, can I? I began, but stopped as I was interrupted by a fit of coughing. Mikato poured me a sippy cup of tea. My eyes strayed again to Suzuki, who had started making snowballs. Mikato tracked my gaze and sighed. I'm sorry, she said. The doctor said you need to rest and stay warm. I nodded and drank the tea. Mikato hesitated for a moment before standing and leaving. She returned a moment later with a book. 
It might be a little early for you, but I thought you might like this, she said, placing it on the table in front of me. Kumi, Kunoichi, I read slowly. It wasn't a picture book. Why don't we read it together? She asked, smiling, and pulling me into her lap and flipping open the first page. What does this say? There was once a. I began and then stopped at the unfamiliar word. Beautiful, Mikato supplied. There was once a beautiful Kunoichi named Kumi, I said. And we worked all the way through chapter one before Suzuki returned sniffling and rosy-cheeked for dinner. It never ceased to amaze me how easy it was to learn things as a kid. In my previous life, I'd been a quick learner, but that was nothing compared to how information would just stick now. Memorization was as easy as breathing. It might have had something to do with the malleability of a child's brain, and I was going to take full advantage of it while it lasted. I also theorized that it might be an Uchiha thing. The Sherry Nan was famed for its copy technique, but I didn't remember things. So I wondered if perhaps the Sherry Nan was just unlocking a mechanism that existed in the minds of all Uchiha and gave them chakra-powered eidetic memory. It might explain why they were famed for their geniuses as well as their eyes. Itaka was brilliant without the Sherry Nan, and I was pretty sure that Suzuki was advanced for his age too, though I didn't exactly have much to compare him to. Speculation on the nature of the Sherry Nan and intelligence aside, I devoured whatever reading material I could get my pudgy hands on. I spent a full two months cooped up inside with pneumonia, so I never lacked for study time. And when I grew bored with reading, I worked on dexterity, usually by drawing. Oh, what's this? Mikato asked, peering over my shoulder at my admittedly childish doodle. It's you, Ka-chan. I said, holding it up. My fine motor control was, a work in progress. Oh, this pretty lady is me. Mikato asked, feigning surprise. Well, why don't I put this up on the fridge? And so she did. She returned to the dinner table as I cleared away my art supplies and picked up Kumi Kunoichi. I'd read it eight times already, and each time it became easier. I was just about to ask for an even more advanced book when Fugaku came home from work looking drawn. Oh, are you reading that all by yourself, Kiyo-chan? He asked. He'd been busy at work, and I was often in bed by the time he came home, so I shouldn't be surprised that he hadn't noticed until now. That's very advanced. I need lots of help, I hedged. The first reading had required Mikato's input at least once or twice per sentence, but by now I could read the entire thing cover to cover. Still. He said, rubbing his chin speculatively. Even Itaka didn't learn to read until he was four. Okay, being gifted was one thing. Outdoing the prodigy of all prodigies was something else entirely. Thankfully Suzuki, who had been playing just outside, peeked in through the open back door and pulled Fugaku into the backyard to watch him practice with the rubber balls. I trailed after him with vague notions of showing off my lackluster skill with throwing. Suzuki demonstrated throwing three balls at a target on the back wheel. Each one landed in the exact center. That's amazing, N.I.I. Chan. I shouted, clapping. His aim and dexterity were, in my opinion, at least as impressive as my storybook reading. Fugaku grunted. If you keep training, you may live up to your brother's example one day, he said. I winced inwardly at the lack of praise and at the way Suzuki's face fell. Suzuki's display was truly a remarkable feat for a toddler, but maybe Itaki had warped Fugaku's expectations for reasonable development. Oh okay, Suzuki mumbled. Fugaku looked like he wanted to say something, but then he just returned inside, leaving us both in the yard. I tugged at Suzuki's sleeve. His eyes were suspiciously wet. N.I.I. Chan, will you show me how to do that? I asked. That was so cool. Suzuki reached up and rubbed his eyes hurriedly before giving me a smile. Sure, he said. It's like this. We practiced until dinner when Itaki arrived home. 
Suzuki showed off his aim, but I still lagged well behind. Itaka wasn't terribly bothered by my lack of throwing ability and instead asked me about my book. I gave a brief explanation of Kumi Kunoichi before asking him to read it with me. Itaki obliged and tucked me under one arm. Suzuki wiggled under the other, and we read together until bedtime. Chapter 3, Toddler Troubles Mikato loved dressing me up. While Suzuki got away with the standard Uchiha shorts and wide-collared shirts, Mikato delighted in purchasing cute clothes for me to wear. I might not have minded as much if shinobi clothing wasn't notoriously ugly. Ninja clothing was strange because it came with a lot of requirements. In general, it had to be durable enough to withstand constant combat and training. It had to be light enough that a shinobi wouldn't overheat due to extended strenuous exercise. It couldn't include any bulky features that could be grabbed during grappling. It couldn't restrict movement. And on top of it all, a shinobi's best concealment technique was to look like a civilian, so it couldn't look ostensibly like ninja clothing while still meeting all of the ninja criteria. Because of this, most clothing in Kanaha was tailor-made. There weren't any big box stores selling mass-produced items, so clothing tended to be whatever the tailor thought was fashionable at the time. It was also dreadfully expensive since pretty much everything was a custom order, and people tended to buy in bulk since it was easier to have 10 identical outfits than to go shopping every three weeks after getting your shorts burned off in training. One of my distant relatives, an older woman named Fumiko, was the clan seamstress. She'd been a kunoichi and a police officer once, but she'd lost her leg during the Third Shinobi War which ended both of those careers rather abruptly. Among ninja, she was considered lucky because she had a clan to support her. There weren't really many social systems set in place in Kanaha. There was no welfare, disability, or social security. Clanless ninja that were unable to continue working often faced serious hardship. The village tried to find them work, but it wasn't always possible. Despite this being her third choice career, Fumiko took to fashion design with a passion. She had an entire wall plastered with sketches and designs for outfits, which made me a little sad because a solid 90% of her shop consisted of the standard Uchiha wide-necked shirts. She was thrilled by Mikato's requests just for the chance to do something a little different. She even made a few suggestions on popular styles, most of which I found a little strange. Ninja fashion tended toward quirks of ninja culture like having mesh undershirts that offered a bit of extra protection without the disadvantage of bulky layers. Another example of that was the tendency to wear bandages as a fashion statement. It was often a necessity born from constant minor injuries during missions and training, as Teijutsu and close-range specialists wore them more often than mid- or long-ranged fighters. I'd felt a stab of fear when we received our new clothes, and Itaki had come downstairs with both his arms wrapped in bandages from hand to elbow. But when he saw my expression he only laughed softly, unraveling the bandages to reveal his pale, unmarred skin. I just need some extra padding now that I've started camping on certain missions, he explained. So don't worry about me, okay? I nodded, a little abashed that I'd jumped to such a silly conclusion. Itaka's team had been upgraded to regular C rank missions, and he was gone for days at a time doing basic bodyguard and escort missions for low risk clients. But it wasn't like he would face anything that could actually hurt him. He was Itaka. Oh, is that a new outfit, Kiyoheim? I blinked and looked up to see a smiling boy standing in the doorway. I squinted at him, but I couldn't feel his presence at all. You're sneaking. I accused, pointing at him. Shisui gave me a Cheshire grin and didn't deny it. At some point he'd noticed that I was a censor and he'd made it his mission to sneak up on me whenever he dropped by. It was just one of the many ways he teased me, like how he always called me Kiyoheim which translated to Princess Kiyo because I acted like a cute little princess. I wasn't sure whether or not to be offended by that, but his easy smile made it difficult to stay mad at him for long. And yes, Kaya-chan got us all new clothes, I added. I did a little twirl to show off my new outfit, 
a long pale blue karate top with an embroidered dark blue obi belt and white leggings. He responded with appropriate sounds of admiration. Very pretty, he said before turning his attention to Itaka. Ready. Itaka nodded, and Suzuki immediately perked up. Hey, hey, I want to train too. He said, nearly tripping in his hurry to put on his shoes. You're too young for this training, said Itaka, smiling and poking Suzuki's forehead. Sorry, Suzuki. Next time. Suzuki puffed out his cheeks, a sure sign of an incoming tantrum. Ah, come on, Itaka, said Shisui with a wink. He crouched down to Suzuki's level. Man, older brothers are the worst, aren't they, Suzuki? Suzuki looked at him suspiciously, half in agreement and half not wanting to insult Itaka. But you know why he doesn't want you to come along, right? It's because after I teach him some super cool ninja stuff, he wants to come home and teach you. Suzuki's face lit up and he turned to attack it. Really, you're gonna teach us? He demanded. Shisui really was a smooth operator despite not having any siblings of his own to practice on. Itaka looked uncertain. Well. Itaka said. Shisui was snickering behind Suzuki's back. Sure. I'll take you camping when I get back. Itaka gave a meaningful look to Shisui which promised retribution, and the two of them vanished in a burst of body flicker. When Itaka returned a week later, he actually decided to make good on that promise. Suzuki was practically vibrating at the thought of going out into the wilds for survival training, but I was less enthused. My ideal camping trip involved a hotel with a nice view, but shinobi were rarely afforded that level of comfort and luxury. At least the weather was on our side with the sun coming out warm and bright on the morning when we left. Itaka led us through the clan grounds and across the many training fields. The land became wilder as we went until we found ourselves in a deep forest. As we walked, Itaka pointed out the different types of trees and plants, naming them and listing how they could be used for various things. When I had to stop and rest, he would break off twigs to show us the shape of the leaves and various berries. Suzuki bounced around trees and bushes excitedly while I held Itaka's hand and scanned the ground carefully for things like snakes and really big bugs. I wasn't expecting anything as dangerous as the forest of death, but wildlife in this world tended to be larger and more dangerous than I was accustomed to. We eventually arrived at a small clearing on an incline above a stream. Itaka demonstrated how to pitch a tent, and we practiced starting fires. He showed us the different ways of stacking firewood to make the fire hotter or smokeless or long-lasting and drilled us on basic safety before going down to the stream to teach us how to fish. He also taught us about making snares for small prey and how to set them in places where they were likely to be sprung. He even quizzed us on edible mushrooms and berries, and we spent most of the afternoon amassing a small feast for dinner. Our snares turned up nothing by nightfall, but Itaka didn't seem overly bothered. We had more than enough fish and foraged plants for dinner. Is this how you get food on missions? I asked as Itaka checked the fish on the fire. I was mentally reviewing the large amount of information he'd managed to cram into one day. It was a good thing children absorbed information like little sponges, because I never would have been able to remember it all otherwise. Not often, he admitted. Most C-rank missions are short enough that we eat ration bars and regular meals instead. Wealthy clients sometimes provide food too. But a good ninja can survive in any location. Did Shisui and Ii-san teach you? I asked. Itaki hadn't attended the academy for very long, so obviously he must have learned it somewhere. Fugaku and Mikato seemed too busy for regular camping trips, and while Shisui had said that he was training Itaka, I suspected that their training was a bit more advanced than basic camping. If they were going camping, it would probably involve giant man-eating creatures and liberal use of deadly weapons. Will he come camping with us sometime? He's very busy, said Itaka. But maybe one day. You're busy too, Suzuki groused. You're always away on missions. 
You should come home more. You must like your teammates better than us. Never, said Itaku. There. He stopped. I'd much rather be with you and Kiyo-chan. This was enough to appease Suzuki, but I squinted at Itaka's hesitation. Don't you like them? I asked. Itaki had always been kind and affectionate towards me and Suzuki, but maybe he didn't get along with his team as easily. They're fine, he said in a perfectly neutral tone. Yeah, and when we grow up to be ninja, the three of us can be on a team together. Said Suzuki eagerly. It didn't really work like that. It was highly unusual for siblings to be on the same team. Missions were inherently risky, and if something went wrong, the village leaders didn't want to wipe out multiple members of a family at once. And, well, for us there was another reason it would never be possible. Maybe, said Itaku, handing over a bowl of fish and berries. Eat up. After dinner, we huddled together by the fire. It was a warm night, so it wasn't strictly required, but I was just as happy for the extra light and the dubious protection it provided. And if I crawled into Itaka's bedroll after hearing something moving in the trees, he didn't comment, only wrapping an arm around me until I drifted off to sleep. The next morning we checked the snares again and found a pair of wild rabbits. Itaka showed us how to skin and cook them, which I tried to watch without turning green. Itaka gave the second one to Suzuki to practice on and said that maybe I could try next time. Suzuki cheerfully offered to let me share in his grisly work, but I shook my head vehemently and said that I could wait until next time. The rabbits tasted delicious. After lunch, we headed home in high spirits, only stopping occasionally to allow me to catch my breath. But as we passed through the main market on the way to the clan grounds, a shopkeeper glanced down at me with a sour expression. Uchiha brats, he grumbled, his eyes going from me to Suzuki to attack it. I wondered if we looked like a gang of hoodlums, which was rather impressive considering our combined ages couldn't purchase a cigarette. A nearby woman shushed him. They're only children, she said. They had nothing to do with. Still Uchiha, grunted the man, his eyes narrowed in disgust. A pair of men beside him looked up, their expressions equally unfriendly. They're all the same. Traitors. Cowards who hid from the Kuabai. What? I asked, but Itaka took my hand and pulled me away. Let's go, Kiyo-chan, he said quietly. He'd gone stiff and wary. Suzuki, who hadn't heard the quiet exchange, looked back at us in puzzlement. Don't listen. How about a race home? Suzuki's face lit up at the challenge, which was answer enough. Itaka swung me up on his back and raced Suzuki, keeping just ahead of his younger brother. He remained tense until we passed through the gate into the clan grounds and didn't stop until we were home. He sent Suzuki and me to get cleaned up and unpacked while he went to talk to Mikato. I didn't hear much more after that, but Mikato warned us not to go wandering through the village by ourselves. This seemed like a common sense thing to tell a pair of three-year-olds, but I wondered if the man's comment had anything to do with it, if anti-Uchiha sentiments were becoming more common, and therefore more dangerous. Something else to worry about. On days when the weather turned foul and Mikato kept us inside, I liked to help her cook traditional Japanese dishes. There was something pleasantly serene about standing on a stool in a warm kitchen with the rain falling outside as I made an ajiri under Mikato's watchful eye. In those moments, I felt truly at peace, like our fate was some distant nightmare rather than an inevitable reality. This was also about the time Mikato sat us down to learn chakra aspect of hand signs. We'd already learned how to make the physical shapes with our fingers through the games she'd taught us as babies, but there was more to it than that. Hand signs were the basis for just about all ninjutsu and genjutsu. They involved building up chakra in our centers and bringing it to our hands, specifically our palms and fingers, and then weaving the chakra together in a specific way. Technically hand signs were not required for chakra techniques, but weaving chakra without them was orders of magnitude more difficult, 
and the hand signs themselves acted a bit like mnemonic devices, decreasing the casting time for a jutsu from minutes to seconds. Of course, that was for skilled practitioners. Suzuki and I fumbled our way through the most basic hand signs with difficulty, and the more complicated ones were next to impossible. It was staggering to realize that Chownin were able to run through a dozen hand seals and the associated chakra manipulation in seconds when it took me a minute to do just one properly. But it all came down to practice. Always practice. Well, there were worse ways to spend a rainy afternoon. The downside of these peaceful days were the equally terrifying stormy nights. I wasn't afraid of thunder. I'd never been afraid of thunder. I had no reason to be afraid of thunder. It was an electrical discharge in the sky. It wasn't dangerous. I was perfectly safe within the house. So why did every single rumble send a needle of terror through my heart? I lay awake, wide-eyed, and fearful, dreading the next boom. Suzuki slept beside me, completely oblivious to the noise. I should be asleep too. There was no reason to. At another thunderous crash I let out a cry of fear. I clasped my hands over my mouth, worried that I'd woken Suzuki, but he was still deeply asleep. I stayed there, frozen and trembling for a long minute until the door slid open and Itaka slipped inside. He met my terrified gaze and gave me a reassuring smile. Don't be afraid, Kiyo-chan, he whispered. It's just thunder. Your big brother's here to protect you. This was so embarrassing. And what was he supposed to do against noise? There was nothing. Another deafening boom made me curl into a ball and whimper. Itaka crawled into my bed and held me in his arms, rubbing my back soothingly. I buried my face into his night shirt. There was nothing he could do, but still, his quiet reassurance made things a little bit easier. I still flinched with each rumble, but I didn't call out again. And when the storm began to wane in the early hours of the morning, I even fell into a light doze with Itaka still holding me close. We trained and played and played and trained. Sometimes it was difficult to tell where one ended and the other began. Itaka was gone more often than not, and whenever Suzuki demanded more ninja training, nine times out of ten, Itaki responded with a forward poke and an apologetic promise of some nebulous next time. Itaka tried to make time for us, he really did. But he had his own training to do on top of his missions, one of which he brought up at dinner one night. Guarding the fire daimyo. Fugaku asked with a hint of surprise. It's a symbolic position, said Itaka. Because my genin team performed the best this year. Obviously, the twelve guardian ninja are his actual guards, said Fugaku. But still, it is quite an honor. As expected of my son. Continue to represent the Uchiha clan to the best of your abilities. I'm sure that your team's track record was largely due to your contributions. Ah, said Itaku, not quite agreeing but not denying it either. He picked at his food and left it at that. Four days later, Itaki returned home with the Sherry Nan. He was only eight. Fugaku praised Itaki for his progress at such a young age, and Itaki smiled, thanking his father for the approval. When Fugaku turned away, Itaki escaped and sat down on the veranda to stare blankly at the sky. I followed, not knowing what to say to him, how anything I could offer would make things better, but I had to try. I tucked my legs beneath me, and wiggled under his arm until he was half hugging me. Ani Ai Chan, what's wrong? I asked. Suzuki crawled into Itaka's lap, smiling and happy to have his big brother home again. It's nothing, said Itaka, though his eyes were oddly bright. He smiled and patted my hair. I met his gaze levelly. Please tell me, I said and Itaka's breath caught in his throat, the brightness in his eyes beating over his lashes. He let out a small sound, like a wounded animal followed by a short gasp as he tried to keep from crying. It wasn't working. Please, I said, holding him tighter. I, I lost my, teammate today, he whispered, words catching as he failed to hold it together. 
I was reminded sharply that despite his natural stoicism, he was still very much a child. I held him tighter. I'm sorry, I said. I buried my face into his chest. He didn't have the normal soft plumpness of a civilian child. He was already lean with hard muscle from intense physical conditioning and had a collection of small scars from training mishaps and people trying to kill him. It was difficult sometimes to see him as a child. Vulnerability was death to a shinobi. If you hadn't come home, I'd be really sad too. He was, he gave his life to protect me, he gasped. And I couldn't. Itaki held Suzuki and me, and he wept for the friend he had lost, for the child that was dead before his eyes. He might not have gotten along very well with his teammates, but clearly this boy had meant something to him in the end. I wasn't, strong enough, he said, still attempting to mute his sobs, fearful perhaps of what would happen if Mikato or Fugaku heard. His grip tensed around us, becoming almost painfully tight. Suzuki was staring up at Itaki in alarm, but I only patted Suzuki's hair absently to reassure him. I thought I was strong, but I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. You survived, I said. I'm glad you came home. If I was with you, and I'd died, I'd still be glad that you were safe. And I think he'd be glad you made it home too. But Itaka shook his head. I couldn't, save him, he said, but his sobs had quieted further. His eyes were sherry non-red with a set of twin tomo. These eyes, one day you'll have them too. Not me, no. But Suzuki. Nii-san. Whispered Suzuki, his eyes also filled with tears, though I couldn't tell if they were sympathy tears or if he was frightened by attack his sudden show of emotion. Ani chan will get stronger, I said. Because he would. Itaka would grow strong enough that no one would ever touch him. He would use that strength to keep Suzuki safe. Then you can save everyone. That was always the solution in this world, get stronger than the people who were trying to hurt you, an eternal arms race of power. Yeah, he said, sniffing quietly and wiping his eyes. The tears were gone now, the wet tracks down his cheeks and his reddened eyes the only evidence that they'd been there at all. If I'm strong, it will never happen again. That was a fool's promise. But he said it with such certainty that I could almost have believed him. I held him until Shisui arrived to take Itaki away for training. Shisui gave us all a friendly wave, but his eyes lingered on Itaki, likely taking note of the redness that couldn't be dispelled so easily. He made no comment. Chapter 4, Playground Pastimes for our fourth birthdays, Mikato presented Suzuki and me with a set of blunt, wooden kunao. They were only moderately less dangerous than their metal counterparts, so we were forbidden from using them unless Mikato was watching us. I couldn't believe we were allowed to play with these. Me more than Suzuki. With his constant training, Suzuki's aim was scarily accurate while mine was, not. Still, at least we were supervised. When Mikato had other things to do, she packed away the weapons and told us to go play in the park. While Suzuki played with our cousins, I spent my time with another present I'd received, a book on Fuinjutsu, the art of sealing. There weren't many books on the subject, but Mikato had unearthed a basic guide as thick as a dictionary. Sealing seemed simple, but only on the surface. You write out what you want to do, and the seal performs the action but it wasn't that easy. Seals were effectively very complicated chakra manipulation exercises that could store things using a physical chakra-rich medium like chakra ink or blood. It practically required a PhD in physics before most of the equations even made sense, so it was easy to see why few people specialized in creating seals. At best, most shinobi memorized one or two commonly used seals, mostly storage scrolls, and left it at that, but I was willing to give it a try. Unsurprisingly, my interest in the math and science side of ninja life didn't really appeal to Suzuki. He wasn't the only one either. The other kids at the park were just as disinterested, which was a little lonely. 
but at least Suzuki been Daiki in the face with a rubber ball when he called me a nerd. We came back to play at the park regularly, and I spent most of my time reading under a tree, though I did occasionally get to socialize with a few other members of our clan. The clan was tight-knit, so everyone knew everyone. I quickly learned that Hiroshi and Hirato had a seemingly infinite supply of sweets to dispense in exchange for a cute smile and that Kazuya was the best storyteller. I discovered that Ichika was patient and always willing to help out if I ran into a difficult kanji and Yui had the most recent clan gossip. I even met one of my few girl cousins on a bright and cold afternoon. Her name was Izumi, and she was willing to share her dango. I liked her immediately. You went to school with my Ani Ai Chan, right? I asked. Itaki had mentioned her once, a noteworthy event since he didn't really talk about anyone. Izumi nodded, looking far away. I want to be strong like him, she said with a hint of sadness. But no matter how hard I try, he always seems so far ahead. My dream is to one day catch up with him. She wouldn't live that long. Something of my thoughts must have showed on my face, because she puffed out her chest. Hey, even if it's a lot of work, I know I'll make it someday, she said. I want to be strong. I know, I said. You have the sherry non, don't you? The sherry non was a fact of life for most Uchiha. It required a traumatic event to activate, but simply being a ninja provided an abundance of those. Just about every member of the clan gained it eventually. I tried very hard not to think about that. It just made me sad. Izumi reached up to touch her face. With these eyes, I can protect everyone, she said. And maybe then the clan will finally accept me. I winced because I'd already heard the gossip from Yui. Despite carrying the clan name, Izumi wasn't really considered a proper Uchiha. Her mother was an Uchiha who had married a clanless ninja and lived away from the clan grounds. That was considered a serious snub, so the clan had collectively chosen to snub them right back. In fact, if it weren't for shinobi naming conventions, she might not have been an Uchiha at all. When a clan-born woman married a clanless man, the woman kept her name and all children were given the clan name. That was why Izumi was still considered an Uchiha and why Naruto was an Uzumaki rather than a Namikaze. No matter how powerful the man, no matter what rank he achieved, the clan name always won in the end. But because of that, loyalty was paramount. Even the tiniest hint that a person might be pulling away from the clan was met with scorn and vitriol, as Izumi had learned firsthand. It cultivated an environment of mistrust where branch families tried to out-loyalty one another, each attempting to prove that they truly belonged. If I hadn't been adopted by Fugaku, I probably would have faced a similar fate, if not worse because I came from four consecutive generations of Uchiha's marrying outside the clan. Beyond that, my parents were both clan-born, my father an Uchiha and my mother an Uzumaki. It was sad to think that if my mother had survived long enough to give me the Uzumaki name, I wouldn't have been adopted into the clan at all. I'd have been sent to an orphanage instead, maybe even raised alongside Naruto instead of Suzuki. Perhaps that would have spared me from an early death. Or perhaps not. It didn't really matter what might have been. I was an Uchiha now, and I was thankful for Fugaku's protection. Not everyone was as lucky as me. It hurt that a sweet girl like Izumi had to struggle to prove that she belonged in her own family. I know you will, Izumi Nei Chan, I said. Maybe that was a little too forward, but my embarrassment was worth it to see the way her face lit up at being called a big sister. On the rare occasions when I played ninja with our cousins, Suzuki always insisted that we were on the same team. He did a fair job of keeping the others from ganging up on me by retaliating with vicious attacks if anyone focused on me for more than a minute or so. It was fun and sweet, if a little awkward to be defended by a four-year-old. You don't have to protect me if you don't want to, I told him after one particularly brutal game. I'd spent the entire match pinned down behind a tree after the rest of our team had been eliminated. Suzuki had valiantly guarded my hiding spot, 
and through sheer grit had turned the tide of battle, eking out a victory from near certain defeat. I'd been, less than useful. It would be a lot easier and more fun for you if you didn't have to worry about me. Suzuki scoffed. You're my little sister, so I gotta, he said easily, like this was an indisputable fact of life. I thought about objecting because I was only technically one month younger than him, and also because I was actually much, much older. But Suzuki seemed to take real pride in being the elder brother, so I let it go. You're a good N.I.I. Chan, I said. He really was. Thank you for looking after me. Suzuki blushed and grinned. One day I'll be strong like N.I.I. San. He said, a picture of pride and admiration. I'll protect the whole clan just like T.O.U. San. My smile faltered, but I replaced it before Suzuki could see. I think you'll become strong enough to protect the whole village, I said carefully. No, strong enough to protect the whole world. I think you'll be even stronger than Ani I Chan one day. Suzuki snorted, but he still smiled. Okay, then, he said, like it was just that easy. I'll become stronger than Ani I San and protect the whole world. Despite having missions, Itaka did try to spend time with us. He took us camping once every month or two if the weather was nice enough. I did eventually learn how to kill and prepare various animals like rabbits, pheasants, and, on one memorable occasion, a deer. Suzuki enjoyed hunting, especially with Itaka, but it still took me a while to get over my squeamishness. Our camping trip soon developed into week-long excursions where we learned to live off of the land in any season. Of course, I always brought along sweets like Dango, which Itaka never turned down, and tomatoes for Suzuki because they were his favorite. I tried to tag along whenever possible, but sometimes my poor health got in the way. Looks like it's just the two of us, said Shisui as he ladled two bowls of rice at the kitchen counter. Fugaku was at work. Mikato was dealing with some sort of clan ceremony and Itaka and Suzuki hadn't returned from their latest hunting trip. On days like this it was good to be part of a clan. There was always someone available for babysitting. Sorry to be a bother, I yawned, rubbing my eyes. I'd spent most of the morning napping, and Shisui had only just woken me for lunch. I sat at the kitchen table wrapped in a thick blanket. It's nothing said Shisui, waving his hand as though to banish the thought. I'd rather be in here with you than out there helping with patrols. As if to highlight his words, the house groaned with a gust of wind and a shower of rain rattled against the window. I wondered if Suzuki regretted the camping trip right now. Then again, Itaka was probably using it as a teaching opportunity. I yawned again. Shisui set down the pair of bowls on the table and handed me a set of chopsticks. Thank you, I said. There was something I wanted to ask you. MHM. He hummed, taking a bite. You're called Shisui of teleportation, right? I asked. Does that mean you're fast? Shisui's lips curled into a slow smile. Hmm, maybe a little bit, he said with faux modesty. Why do you ask? I wanted to know how you do it, I said. Despite living in a ninja family, seeing actual ninja techniques was pretty rare. Most ninja didn't use chakra for day-to-day -day things when mundane methods worked just as well. But I was still curious. I could feel chakra, but beyond basic control exercises, I couldn't figure out how to use it for anything. I knew that basic chakra muscle enhancement was possible, and enhanced speed seemed like an easy place to start. Shisui chuckled. Training, lots and lots of training, he said. I use a technique called the body flicker. It involves infusing muscles with chakra to increase power output. Do you want to see a demonstration? I nodded, perking up. Okay, watch closely. His chakra flared, and suddenly there were three Shisui sitting around the table. I looked between them, a little shocked at how normal and solid they all looked. I reached out to touch the nearest Shisui. He felt solid, 
but there was a strange warmth and barely noticeable vibration when I touched him. I touched the second and third Shisuas and felt the same thing. You feel fuzzy, I said since I didn't have any better way of describing it. That's because I'm only here one third of the time, said the Shisui on my left. And I'm over here another third of the time, said the one on my right. And here too, said the last. But really, if you move fast enough, you can be in multiple places at once, they said together. Okay, that was a little creepy. Abruptly, the other two Shisuis vanished, and the remaining Shisui solidified. Can you teach me to do that? I asked. You don't have enough chakra yet, he said. I deflated with disappointment. Buyuwood I do have something you can work on. He picked up my chopsticks and gathered a bite-sized bit of rice. Come on, Kiyoheim, your lunch is getting cold. Say ah. Uh. I scowled. I can feed Mij MPH. I nearly choked as Shisui's hand darted forward to slip the rice into my mouth. He laughed at my affronted expression. More than chakra or control, the thing that limits a shinobi's top speed is their reaction time, he said, gathering up another bite-sized bit of rice. So why don't we play some reflex games? Say AHH. I knew what he was doing, but even if his motivation was just to feed me lunch, I wasn't going to pass up a chance to do speed training with Shisui. As it turned out, my reaction time was abysmal. I don't know what I expected, but I'd hoped that it wasn't that bad. However, it only took half the bowl of rice for me to realize that I couldn't even see Shisui move unless I focused my whole attention on his hand. And by the time we'd finished, I was struck by the fact that I hadn't felt him use his chakra at all. This was Shisui's base speed, completely unenhanced. That was insane. After lunch we moved on to other reflex games that could be played in the living room. I wasn't expecting miracles, but even Shisui's casual, not even trying speed was overwhelming. It was scary to think that there were people in this world who fought and killed at this level. Most people wouldn't even see him coming. Breathe in, deep breath, said the medic as she pressed a stethoscope into my ribs. Hold. Okay, exhale. Mikato sat in a nearby chair with her hands folded patiently in her lap. My last bout of flu had cleared up three days ago, but this morning I'd been hit with a wave of nausea and vomiting along with fever and muscle pain. I'd debated on whether or not to tell Mikato. They just sent me home again with strict orders for bed rest and I was tired of bed rest. Besides, Itaki and Shisui were planning to take us camping for Suzuki's fifth birthday. But Itaki had noticed that something was wrong before I made it out the door, and now here we were. Suzuki had offered to wait, but I knew how long hospital visits could take and didn't want to ruin his day. I looked out the window and hoped they were having a good time. I'm concerned with this discoloration, she said, setting aside the stethoscope and gesturing to the purple spots on my legs. I'll have to perform a diagnostic jutsu. Mikato nodded and the medic ran through a series of hand signs. Her hands glowed with warm green chakra that she pressed into my chest. I focused on keeping my breathing steady as her chakra flowed through my body. It felt weird but not painful as it spilled from my chakra coils into my veins and up my spine. And then it stuttered, pooling at the tip of my spinal column. One moment please, said the medic, carefully withdrawing her chakra. I'll need to contact a specialist. Mikato frowned but agreed. The medic returned later with a grey-haired senior medic. She ran through the same diagnostic jutsu, though without the hand signs. I felt the difference in their chakra, how the older woman's was sharper and clearer. It moved with purpose, following the same path up my spine and stopping. Bacterial meningitis, she said. I had no idea what that was, but her grim tone got the point across well enough. And if it hadn't, Mikato's reaction would have. I was admitted into the ICU, pumped full of antibiotics and fluids along with a cocktail of chakra-based medicines. I was hooked up to no less than eight small, beeping machines spread across two carts, 
and my bed was inked with five separate medical seals. I was left to stare at the ceiling while the medic spoke to Fugaku and Mikato outside. Someone had left the door ajar. There's a 66% survival rate, and we caught it early, she said. Send in anyone she's had contact with in the past week. We'll want to screen them as well. Have a Sumi-san screen your clan. We've had a few cases, but there's no guarantee that she got this from the hospital. I winced. Sorry, Suzuki. Fugaku left and Mikato returned wearing a face mask and gloves. Her eyes were wet, and I felt inexplicably guilty. Sorry, Kaya-chan, I said. Mikato shook her head as she sat on my bed. I scooted over until my head rested in her lap. She wove her fingers through my hair, stroking gently. I just want you to be okay, she said. Is there anything you need? Are you in pain? I was lucky. I rarely felt discomfort while sick. This was probably the worst I'd ever felt with constant body aches, but it was manageable, especially with the medical chakra dulling the pain. It sounded like I was going to be here for a while. Or that I might die. If I'd gone on the camping trip with the others, would I have made it back? Or worse, would I have infected Itaki, Suzuki, and Shisui? Scary thought. Kaya-chan, are there any books on medical ninjutsu? I asked. That was a field of study I knew would take years if not decades of dedicated learning to master, but the diagnostic jutsu hadn't looked difficult. If I survived this, that would be a terribly useful skill for someone with a weakened immune system. If nothing else, there was no harm in asking. That's quite advanced, she said hesitantly. I was ready to let it go, but she gave me a thoughtful look. Very few members of the clan specialize in medicine, but there are a few. It favors those with fine chakra control. If you're interested, I'll have Asumi Obachan test your control levels and give you some books to get started. Maybe she'd been thinking the same thing. Thank you, Kaya-chan. Asumi Obachan was my great-grandmother. She came from a time before the village, back when each of the clans had been forced to tend to their own injured as well as they could. She was an Uchiha by marriage rather than blood but she'd been welcomed into the clan because of her chakra healing abilities. Now with the hospital handling medical issues and the police force absorbing any potential Uchiha medics into their ranks, she was among the last of a dying breed. She gave me a series of simple tests including the leaf sticking exercise that I'd mastered while still in my crib and a few more challenging exercises, some of which went well beyond my current abilities. Her control is very advanced for her age, said Asumi Obachan. But it's not at the level required for the beginner's lessons on medical ninjutsu. At this level, her chakra would only aggravate injuries, and demonstrations would be pointless. However, I'll assign a lesson plan and perform another assessment when she is ready. That was rather nebulous in terms of shinobi training regimens. Then again, I was only four, and I had a feeling that Asumi Obachan wasn't thrilled at the prospect of such a small child wandering around her clinic. Maybe she was hoping that I would lose interest until I was older? Well, it gave me time to read the science books at least. I'd already brushed up on a few of the scientific principles while studying sealing, but when I cracked open a thick chemistry textbook, it didn't take long to see how much I still had to learn. Thankfully, I'd already taken college courses on everything except the chakra, so it would mostly be a refresher course and a lesson in Japanese scientific jargon. It was enough to keep me occupied during the month I spent in the hospital. Thankfully no one else in the clan had contracted the disease, but I was still under strict semi-permanent bed rest orders even after they sent me home. What are you reading, Kiyo-chan? I blinked up at the speaker olishly. I was a third of the way through a chakra chemistry book with a dictionary propped open to my left and a sheaf of messy notes to my right. There was a joke in there somewhere about me having a doctor's handwriting already, but I hadn't had time to study calligraphy on top of everything else, no matter how useful it would be to my studies in sealing. Ani-chan, you're back. 
I said. He'd been gone for several weeks performing an escort mission to the land of T. I tried to stand up, but my muscles hadn't quite recovered from my last hospital stay, so I flopped sideways instead. Itaka caught me easily, and I fumbled into a sitting embrace. You shouldn't go away for so long. I know, he said, returning the hug. He was still travel-stained from his mission and smelled like sweat and dirt. No blood or smoke. That was good. Itaka withdrew long enough to produce a small box from his pack. It was covered in bright wrapping paper. I'm sorry. And happy birthday. I blinked at him. Birthday. Well that would explain the brightly colored picture Suzuki had given me this morning and the set of metal Konao Mikato and Fugaku had presented me that matched the set Suzuki had received on his birthday. Oh, right, it's my birthday, I said. I'd been in my room all day except for snatching up a hurried breakfast. I'd spent the morning working on a set of tricky chakra control exercises. By the time I'd mastered the last one I was too exhausted to go back downstairs and had decided to read instead. Don't tell me you forgot. He asked, eyebrow raised. You only turn five once. Well, twice in my case, but he didn't need to know that. I was busy. I excused. I took the box curiously and tore off the wrapping paper. Inside was a beautiful blue ribbon. In the past year, my hair had started to grow quite long and often got in the way. I loved long hair, but when it was blowing in my face and obscuring my vision during a game of ninja, I loved it a little less. Oh thank you, Ani Ai Chan. This is perfect. Will you help me put it on? I turned around, and Itaki ran his fingers through my hair, gathering up the fringe on either side of my face, pulling it back while allowing the rest of my hair to hang loose. He tied the ribbon in a bow, and when he was done I shook my head vigorously to test how well it stayed in place. Unsurprisingly, it held up and kept my hair out of my eyes. What has you so busy that you forgot your own birthday? Itaki asked. I told him about my interest in medical ninjutsu and the chakra control exercises and the books I was reading. That's all very advanced, he said, a near echo of Mikato. I flushed and looked down. I can't do any of it, I said. I held up the dictionary. I can't even read half of it. You will in time, said Itaki. And if it hadn't been for the massacre coming in three years, he might have been right. Do you know medical ninjutsu? I asked. Itaki had never expressed any visible interest in it, but it seemed like the kind of thing he would know. Only a tiny bit, he admitted, standing up. And I don't have enough training to use it on others yet. Come on. It's your birthday. You shouldn't be spending it in your room. At the moment, I was just chai of chakra exhaustion, so Itaka swung me up on his back and carried me outside where Suzuki was practicing with his kunao under Mikato's supervision. She gave Itaki a nod and returned to the house, content that Itaka would watch over us. Hey, Nii-san, look at this. Suzuki shouted as Itaka set me down on the veranda. Suzuki took two kunao, one in each hand, and threw them both at once. One of them hit their target and the other one went wide by a few inches. Suzuki's face fell. Ah, I could do it with the wooden ones. The metal kunao were different from their wooden counterparts. They were heavier and had different balance. It took more strength to throw them, and they actually stuck to the target rather than bouncing off. Try again, but put a little more strength into your left hand throw, said Itaka. Itaka must have been in a celebratory mood to actually offer advice on ninja techniques. Then again, this wasn't really anything special. It gave the illusion of offering training while simply reinforcing what we already knew. Suzuki seemed happy enough, though. I sat back and stretched out my legs, watching Suzuki thoughtfully. Itaki had been gone more and more often these past few months, and although I'd been engrossed in my own studies, I hadn't missed the widening space between us all. There had always been a bubble around Itaki. 
he'd been separated from his peers and family by his genius, but that wasn't the only reason. There were many aspects of life in Kanaha that he just didn't agree with. Did he even have anyone to talk to? Shisui maybe. Despite all the time we spent playing together and all the gentle smiles he turned towards Suzuki and me, he never really confided in either of us. Well, he had once after the death of his teammate, but that had been the exception, a momentary crack in his armor that he'd quickly mended. And that was fair. We were only five, and he probably didn't want us to bear the burdens he'd been given at that age. What's wrong, Kiyo-chan? Asked Itaki, his eyes gentle and concerned. I hadn't realized that I was frowning, but Itaki had obviously noticed. I made a subtle show of looking around. Do you promise not to tell? I asked quietly. This piqued his interest, and his smile widened. I promise, he said. I leaned in close. I'm not sure I want to be a kunoichi, I muttered, barely more than a breath of air. A normal person would have had difficulty hearing it, but Itaka was a shinobi. His smile became sad. Being a ninja is an honor and brings honor to the clan, he said, though with far less conviction than Fugaku would have managed. I know, I said. But I was just thinking about it, about what it all means. Right now we're training with Kunao by throwing them at targets, but one day we'll be throwing them at people instead. People like us. People with mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, clans and friends. They'll have hopes and dreams, right? They won't want to die. But we'll fight, and in the end, one of us will have to go. Maybe it's them. Maybe it's me. And what for? Because a client said so. Because the Hokage said so. That doesn't seem right. Questioning the Hokage was borderline treasonous, but I was young enough to get away with it. Probably. We fight to protect the things important to us, said Itaka. Our family, our friends, and our home. Maybe in an ideal world. But the reality of being a shinobi was very different. And why would they want to hurt us? I asked. Itaka looked away into the sky. Those who have suffered terribly may lash out even against those who have done them no wrong, he said. Those who are afraid might do the same and some may bring pain and death to others for selfish goals. The cycle of violence. I don't want to hurt anyone, I said, and Itaka looked back at me, his expression oddly tired. I know, he said. I don't want to hurt anyone either. But he would. He would hurt everyone he'd ever cared about. Do you think the fighting will ever stop? I asked with all my supposed childish naivete. Itaki had killed his first enemy when he was four. He'd watched his comrade die before his eyes, and soon he would massacre his entire family to protect Suzuki. Maybe one day, he said, and I couldn't tell if it was a white lie or his own naive hope. Either way, we sat in silence and watched Suzuki gather up his kunao, ready to try again. One day there might be peace, but for now, our brother was honing his ability to kill, and neither of us stood to stop him. Chapter 5, The Genin You're what? I asked, sure I must have misheard. I was sitting under a cherry tree in one of the public parks outside of the Uchiha district. Mikato had reluctantly agreed to let Suzuki and me play here as long as we promised to be careful and stay together. Suzuki was readily accepted into a game of ninja, but I was still on light medical restrictions. My attempts at staying out of the way had been thwarted, however, since I'd been approached by a thin, brown-haired boy with a snub nose and a smear of dirt across one cheek. He'd come to me with a simple demand. You're the prettiest girl on the playground, so be my girlfriend, he said again, proving that I had not, in fact, misheard him the first time. I wasn't even sure how he'd come to that conclusion. I was only five years old, and all five-year-olds tended to look the same with chubby cheeks, large eyes, and cute outfits. Maybe it was because I was the new girl and therefore glamorous by playground standards. No, I said, 
perhaps a little heartlessly. But there wasn't much else I could say. I wasn't even sure he knew what a girlfriend was. Weren't boys supposed to be afraid of cooties at this age? He scowled and folded his arms. You'll be my girlfriend, or I'll tell my NII San on you, he declared with finality. I blinked at the odd statement and gave him a puzzled look. He's a genin. That clarified nothing. Maybe the boy was from a civilian family who were impressed by the status of genin. In the Uchiha clan, it was a requirement that all children attend the academy. The family business was running the police force, and the police only recruited clan members who had passed the Chinin exams, which was fair since they were expected to police other ninja. Okay. I said uncertainly. You do that. I'm going to read my book now. I raised my book to cover my face. The boy lingered for a few more seconds before stomping away. I felt bad, but if I was completely honest, I didn't want to leave too much of an impression on other people. My death was inevitable, and I didn't want anyone grieving over me. It was different with the clan because, well, we would all go together. Except for Suzuki and Itaku. But there was nothing I could do about that. Just as I was about to return to my reading, there was a burst of activity from across the park. I craned my neck, searching for the cause, and I nearly dropped my book in shock. Blonde hair. Whisker marks. Enormous chakra. Yep. There was no denying it. That was Uzumaki Naruto, plainly identifiable even though he wasn't wearing his normal orange outfit. Instead he had a white shirt with the Uzumaki symbol and a pair of brown pants. I was mildly confused by the serious lack of orange on his clothing, but he probably wasn't acting out for attention just yet. Naruto was standing opposite a group of children who were telling him to get lost. He gave a heartfelt objection, but the children's dismissal was final. He hesitated a moment longer before hanging his head and walking away. I had a brief moment of indecision. I didn't want to interfere with people who might be hurt by my death. Furthermore, I was an Uchiha. My clan was under watch because the village elders thought that we had unleashed the Kiwabai on the village. I had exactly zero reasons to give for seeking out Naruto and talking to him. Approaching him would only bring trouble for everyone. And yet. I was on my feet, my books abandoned in the grass as I hurriedly closed the distance between us. Hey. I called, waving to get his attention. Naruto turned and eyed me warily as I came to a halt a few feet away. I opened my mouth and tried to remember how young children made friends. I'd never been a social butterfly in either of my lives, and I hadn't exactly planned out a brilliant introduction. I saw you, I mean do you want to play, read. It's not really playing. I'm Kiyo, and new, to the park, I mean, and, I, uh, I was reading, and I have, um, snacks. What? Naruto asked at my half-mumbled, stuttering speech. A simple hello shouldn't have been this hard. At least he didn't look suspicious anymore. I took a moment to orient my thoughts into something coherent. Hi, I'm Kiyo, I said. Do you want to read with me? I have some snacks to share if you're hungry. I may as well have asked a drowning man if he'd like a life preserver. The sheer joy that appeared in his bright blue eyes was a little heartbreaking. Hey, yeah, Databia. He shouted. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. Uzumaki. I asked. My birth mother was an Uzumaki. Are you one of my cousins? It probably wasn't a close familial relationship. The Uzumaki clan had been scattered for several generations, so tracing any kind of lineage was virtually impossible. The fact that Naruto had been left utterly alone to raise himself implied that he had no family on either side. Hey, yeah, do you think so? He asked, the joy turning to longing. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I shrugged and led him back to my tree. As I picked up my book, it occurred to me that medical texts weren't exactly normal reading material for a five-year-old. But it was fine. 
I had brought along a chapter book for when the technical jargon started giving me a headache. Have you ever heard of Kumi Kunoichi? I asked. Naruto shook his head. This was the fourth book in the series, so I gave him a brief rundown of the story so far. I started from the beginning, reading aloud at a normal pace until I noticed Naruto's distressed and confused expression. Do you want to read? I asked. Um, I can't, he said, looking abashed. You're really smart. How old are you? I asked. It was October, so. Um, I'm four, but my birthday is tomorrow, said Naruto, flushing slightly with embarrassment. I blinked, but then I reminded myself that we were five, or almost five, and most five-year-olds had limited, if any, reading skills. So I went back to the beginning and read slowly, tracing the words as I went along just like Ataki had done for me when I was a baby. Naruto listened to the story carefully, sometimes asking questions. Naruto wasn't really what I was expecting. He wasn't loud or boastful or quick-tempered. He was quiet and a little shy. If anything, he just seemed really happy to have someone to talk to. We paused for a bit to eat some of my snacks, and eventually Suzuki wandered over. Who are you? Suzuki demanded, looking at Naruto with narrowed, distrustful eyes. I blinked. That was, unusually aggressive for Suzuki. I glanced behind him. The kids he'd been playing with were watching us with frowns and anxious expressions. Had one of them warned him about Naruto? I'm Uzumaki Naruto, Databia. Naruto said, matching Suzuki's challenging glare. Ah, there was the loudness. You got a problem with me too. And there was the temper. Any, Naruto, this is my Nii Chan, I said, attempting to smooth things over. First impressions were important, and they were going to be friends one day. Best friends. His name is Suzuki, and he always looks after me. Suzuki folded his arms, still staring at Naruto. Let's go, Kiyo-chan, he said. It's gonna rain, and you need to go back inside or you're gonna get sick again. I hadn't noticed it before, but the sky had grown dark with angry storm clouds. Yeah. I said as I packed up my books. I didn't want to risk getting them wet. Hey, Naruto, I'll be back tomorrow morning if you want to read with me again. Really? Asked Naruto, his eyes wide and hopeful. Yeah, I'd like that. Suzuki scowled more. He snatched my hand and half dragged me out of the park. Naruto watched me go with a small wave and a big grin. When we were out of earshot, I pulled away from Suzuki. What was that about? I asked. Suzuki kicked a small stone. If you want to read with someone, then read with me, he said petulantly, which made me blink. Suzuki had never really shown possessive tendencies before. But he'd also never had to compete for my attention either, and he didn't seem to like the idea very much. And Kaya-san told us to be careful. Yep. The other kids had definitely warned him against Naruto. I sighed. I'd just have to get them to play together tomorrow. They'd learn to get along. Okay, we can read together when we get home, I said, which mollified his moodiness. And Naruto isn't bad. He's just lonely. Suzuki only grunted. That night, after reading with Suzuki, I baked Naruto a cupcake and asked Mikato if I could give away a few of my gently used picture books for a friend's birthday. Mikato seemed thrilled, her eyes lighting up at the prospect of a new friend. I carefully avoided mentioning Naruto by name, instead saying that I'd met a boy who wanted to read with me. Since I'd long since outgrown the picture books, Mikato offered to help me wrap them up in fancy wrapping paper. I thought they looked pretty good as tucked them safely into my book bag. The next day Suzuki came down with a sudden cold. Even with his numerous protests that he was fine, Mikato sent him to bed with plenty of water and some medicine to help him sleep. He was out like a light in ten minutes flat. 
I had to admit that it felt a little strange to be the healthy child in the family for once. Kaya Chan, can I still go to the park to meet my friend? I asked, holding up the presents. She hesitated, looking worried. I feel fine, and I promise I'll be careful. After a long minute of consideration, where she touched my forehead in search of a fever, she nodded. If you start feeling unwell, come home right away, she said. And don't wander off with strangers. I nodded quickly and headed out. The park was deserted, likely due to the rainstorm last night which had turned much of the open space into a muddy expanse that no sane mother would want her children running around in. Naruto was already waiting under the cherry tree looking uncertain. I smiled and waved as I ran up to greet him while pulling out his present and holding up the cupcake. Happy birthday, Naruto. I said. He looked at the gift and the cupcake as though he'd never seen anything like them before. Are these for me? He asked tentatively. Yeah, I said. You said your birthday is today, right? Friends give each other presents on their birthdays. Well, we weren't really what I'd call friends. We probably weren't allowed to be friends, but no one had forbidden it yet, and I since I was pretty sure that Naruto didn't receive many gifts, I wanted to make the most of this one. If anyone asked, I could honestly say that I hadn't even gone out of my way. See. Plausible deniability. Friends. He asked, taking the present and the cupcake. I sat down on a dry patch of grass beneath the tree and he settled in beside me, carefully putting the cupcake aside and ripping off the wrapping paper to reveal the books. We can read them together, I said. I'll teach you. It'll be fun. Naruto nodded. His eyes were bright and his grin was unbearably wide. Yeah. He shouted. Thanks, Kyo-chan. Naruto wanted to start with Tuma the Sneaky Ninja. It was one of the simpler books with many bright pictures and sections that popped up. I made sure to use exaggerated voices while reading, and Naruto paid close attention to the shape and sounds of the words. We'd only been reading for about ten minutes when a shadow fell over us. Naruto stiffened while I merely looked up, puzzled at the interruption. It was the brown-haired boy from yesterday, only this time he was with another boy that was maybe 13 or 14 years old. The older boy was frowning down at us. He wore a Kanaha forehead protector as a long sash around his waist that was decorated with an odd assortment of trinkets and bits of fabric. So, you're the girl who broke my little brother's heart? He asked. What? I asked. I looked at the boy and back at his older brother. That was a slightly melodramatic way of putting it. I guess. The genin unfolded his hands and put them on his hips, leaning forward to loom over me. What kind of older brother would I be if I let a little Uchiha brat mess with my kid brother? He asked, and he smirked, slow and vicious. And here you are with the village freak instead. You know, there are only so many insults a guy can take. But hey, I'll tell you what. If you agree to be my little brother's girlfriend, I'll let you off just this once. I could only stare. Really? Really? No, I said. It figures, he said. You Uchiha are always so arrogant. You think you're too good for my little brother, huh? I think I'll just have to teach you a lesson. Naruto was on his feet in an instant. Hey, you leave her alone. He said. You wanna fight someone? How about me? Oh no. This was not good. I hadn't seen Naruto in action, but I did recall that he hadn't had the best skills even during the academy. At this point, against an actual genin, he wouldn't stand a chance. Wait. I said, but the genin already lashed out, catching Naruto with a vicious right hook. Naruto. But Naruto wasn't down yet. He managed to stay upright and swung his fist, the genin sidestepping it easily and hitting him again and again. Stop it. Leave him alone. I was not a fighter. In my former life, I'd never thrown a single punch or kick at anyone. 
Here, I hadn't even started Taijutsu training and I'd left my kunao at home. I didn't even have anything to throw. Well, no, that wasn't quite true. When the genin pulled his arm back for another swing, I beamed him in the face with intermediate virology and pathogenesis volume 3 followed by practical clinical microbiology and finally Kumi Kunoichi and the curse of the daimyo's jewels, which he managed to snatch out of the air. He gave the book a disdainful glance before taking a fistful of pages and ripping them out, scattering them in the mud at his feet. That. That was a library book. Unfortunately, that was also the last of my ammunition since the picture books were all out of reach. The genin retaliated with a swift backhand that sent me to the ground. I lay there for a moment, stunned and clapping a hand over my eye. It felt like my eyeball had nearly exploded from the force of the hit. He'd hit me. He'd hit me. No one had ever hit me before. But the danger wasn't over yet. There was no reason to think that he would stop. Get up. Get up. Get up. I scrambled to my feet in time to see the genin grab Naruto by the front of his shirt and punch him twice in the nose. Leave him alone. I shouted. The genin glanced over at me, and the last thing I saw was his fist. I woke with Naruto shaking me. His left eye was swollen and his nose was bleeding. I felt something warm and sticky trailing down my lips and chin and tasted the coppery tang of blood. The genin and his younger brother were gone. You okay? Naruto asked. I wiped away the blood and out. Uh, I touched my nose tentatively, but I was pretty sure it was fractured if not broken. My left eye also stung, and I couldn't seem to open it all the way. Some more gentle probing revealed swelling, so we really were a matched pair. I'm okay, I mumbled. Are you? Yeah, it happens a lot, he said, standing up and holding out his hand. I took it, and he pulled me up. Well, that explained why he'd been so defensive with Suzuki yesterday. He probably thought Suzuki was looking for a fight. Sometimes it was easy to forget that this was a world of ninja. A large portion of the population was trained to use violence to solve their problems. Even the children were taught to fight, and the cycle of violence didn't spare innocence. I'd acknowledged Mikato's concern about my safety but had dismissed it as her being overprotective. It hadn't even occurred to me that her fears were justified, that someone might actually want to hurt me. And Naruto. He didn't even have a clan to keep him safe. The village hated him for what he was, and no one was around to protect him. Surely the third would have done something to ensure his safety? But if there was a guardian angel lurking somewhere, they hadn't shown themselves. Naruto helped me gather up my books. All of them, including Naruto's picture books, had been ripped apart and scattered in a muddy puddle. The cupcake was nothing more than a squashed mess in the dirt. Naruto also pulled my bag, now cut open and useless, from the branch of the tree and handed it over without meeting my eyes. I'm sorry, I said. You were hurt because of me. It's not your fault, he said. He beats me up sometimes. That's probably why he... He cleared his throat, his eyes wet. You'd be safer if you didn't hang out with me anymore. Naruto, this wasn't your fault, I said. It was mine. I hadn't even registered that the boy was threatening me yesterday. I was so accustomed to having ninja relatives that the implication had gone straight over my head. And I'd come back to the park alone. I was an idiot. I took Naruto's hand, but he wouldn't look at me. I should go, he said, pulling away. And then he took off, running out of the park and down the street. I started to follow after him but when I realized that I was standing in the park alone once more, a surge of terror lanced through my heart. I gasped for air, suddenly unable to breathe until the stab of panic eased. I looked once in the direction Naruto had gone, and then I ran straight home as fast as my legs would carry me. I'd never felt as relieved as when I passed through the entrance to the Uchiha district. Maybe this was why my clan plastered our symbol over absolutely everything. It gave a sense that this was ours, 
This was safe, and this was home. I slowed to a walk and ducked into an alley, taking the back route towards my house. If anyone saw me, they'd ask what had happened. I could imagine how the clan would react if they discovered that a Kanaha ninja had attacked an Uchiha child. Sure, it was because I'd rejected his little brother, but he'd called my clan arrogant and he'd called me a little Uchiha brat. It would be easy for someone to twist that into an attack against the Uchiha. Not to mention what the village leaders would think if they knew an Uchiha was trying to get close to Naruto. I could guess at where that road would lead. I shuddered. No. No one could ever find out. I'd have to hide it somehow. I stopped at the back gate, and reached out with my chakra sense toward the house to get a bit of extra range. Mikato must have gone out and Suzuki's chakra was in his room, subdued in a way that indicated sleep. If I was quick and quiet, I just might. Kiyo-chan. I jumped, dropping the remains of my books in the grass and whirling around to see Itaki. His eyes darted over my bloody face, across my slashed bag, and down to the shredded books at my feet. I stood, trembling. I hadn't wanted him to see me like this. I hadn't wanted anyone to see me like this. Please, don't tell Tio Yu Chan, I said, my eyes burning with shame. I'd known how dangerous it would be for everyone if I got close to Naruto, and yet I... Please. Itaki approached me slowly as if I was a wounded animal. He knelt, holding a glowing green hand up to my face. I flinched when he touched me, his chakra sliding beneath my skin and numbing the pain. He didn't speak as he worked, reducing the swelling and mending my fractured nose. I tried to look away, but he put a gentle hand under my chin and lifted my face up. Who did this to you? His words were soft, inviting me to talk without judgment. But that just made it worse. Itaka's first kill had been at four years old against a fully grown ninja who had wanted him dead. He'd fought and killed and watched comrades die before his eyes. Compared to that, what was a little playground scuffle? Nothing. It was nothing at all. I just shook my head, and after a minute of silence, Itaka gathered up the remains of my books and took me inside. As we passed a mirror in the hall, I caught a glimpse of my reflection. I looked awful. My face was alternately a blotchy red and the sickly yellow-brown of a fresh bruise that would turn into a black eye without treatment. My shirt was muddy with flecks of blood splattered down the front. And my ribbon was gone. Itaka set me down in my room and arranged the torn-up pages into a neat pile. I'll take care of these, he said, still soft. He stood to leave. Another surge of panic pierced my heart, and I grabbed at his sleeve. Don't go, I said, the words half choked with a sob. I made an effort to keep quiet. I didn't want to wake Suzuki. Please don't leave me. Itaka knelt back onto the floor and pulled me into his lap while I cried. I tried to hold it together. I really did. I was an adult. The fight was over. There was nothing to cry about. But my body was still that of a child, and the tears wouldn't stop. Itaki held me, patting my head and rubbing my back, silent and patient until I'd cried myself out. And he continued to hold me after. You're all right now, Kiyo-chan, he said. You're okay. You're okay. But I wasn't. I really, really wasn't. Chapter 6 Lessons Learned Bronchitis Itaki had tended my injuries to the point where I could claim that I'd tripped and had fallen down the stairs, which of course prompted another round of hospital visits due to my inexplicable bout of dizziness. This turned out to be a good thing, however, since the medics caught my newest illness early. Yeah, but it should clear up soon, I said with forced optimism. It always does. I was sitting at the Kotetsu as snow fell outside. I was once again being denied the chance to play in the snow due to another entry in my long list of medical conditions. Itaki had just returned from a mission and still had fresh snow melting into his hair. He smelled like trees and sweat and metal, 
the sense I associated with him after a long mission where he had little access to things like showers and comfortable beds. I gave him a hug anyway. Itaki returned the hug and took a moment to brush his fingertips over my new blue ribbon. It had appeared on my desk the morning after I'd lost the previous one, an obvious gift from Itaki before leaving on his mission. I was grateful because I loved my ribbon, and Mikato and Fugaku would surely notice its absence if I suddenly stopped wearing it. I coughed to clear my throat. Are you going camping again with Nii Chan? I asked. I couldn't quite smother the hint of wistfulness. Suzuki was busy practicing the leaf sticking exercise Itaki had shown him. He perked up at the mention of camping, the leaf he'd been trying to stick to his forehead disintegrating from his moment of inattention. It's not really the best weather for that, said Itaki. Suzuki pouted but didn't object. He merely grabbed another leaf and placed it on his forehead to try again. I supposed that Suzuki wasn't too keen on camping in bad weather either. Tio Yusan is sending us back to Nekoba tomorrow, though. Nekoba lived in the ruins of an abandoned city called Saraku about a day's walk from Kanaha. Suzuki and Itaka went there occasionally to pick up supplies for the clan. I'd accompanied them once, using my pocket money to buy cat treats with the intent of making as many feline friends as possible. It worked, perhaps better than expected, because it only took about ten minutes until I was happily buried under a pile of purring cats. Oh, well maybe I'll be better by then, I said. Itaka made a sound that was neither agreement nor disagreement. Yeah, I didn't really think so either. You, you go outside the village a lot, right? I asked, coughing only a little bit. Itaka nodded because of course he did. Can you use your genjutsu to show me what the outside world looks like beyond the forest? I'd held a small hope that I'd be able to explore this world before my death. I'd wanted to make it to the ocean at least once, but my hospital stays were growing more frequent, not less. And I'd heard Mikato question if I should ever be enrolled in the academy. It was technically a requirement for all Uchiha children, but she wondered if even classwork would be too much for me. Saraku was likely the farthest I would ever travel, and that was still in Kanaha's proverbial backyard. Itaka, even at this age, had traveled to other countries, if only briefly. And I wanted so badly to see something beyond Kanaha. There isn't really much out there, he said. It's mostly just forest and fields. I looked down to hide my disappointment. Oh, oh, I said. Maybe I'd expected too much. It wasn't like Itaki had gone sightseeing. He'd been working. Well, maybe there is something I can show you, he said after a minute. He closed his eyes briefly, and when he opened them again, they were sherry non-red. Will it hurt? I asked, suddenly nervous. No, he said, his chakra reaching out to brush against mine, not unlike a medical ninjutsu. It slipped in through my eyes and wove lines of power through my mind. And I was. Standing in a clearing speckled with large stones. The trees were crowned in orange and gold. And in the long grass there were bright blue wild flowers. No, not flowers. Butterflies. The wind kicked up, sweeping through the clearing and making the grass dance like waves at sea, and all at once the butterflies took to their wings in a cloud of iridescent blue. I said, reaching up but not daring to touch one in case it broke the genjutsu. Itaka stood next to me, smiling gently as a butterfly alighted onto his palm. He held it out to me. I extended my index finger and stroked the wing with care. It's so beautiful, I said, all mixing with surprise. I'd never been under genjutsu before. I'd always pictured it as a dream. But there was nothing dreamlike about this at all. I could feel the breeze, smell the perfumed air, and hear the barest hint of fluttering wings. Can you teach me genjutsu? Itaka breathed a quiet laugh. I thought you were studying medical techniques, he said. And sealing. I am. I said, perhaps a little too defensive. I just, I want to learn. 
even if it's too early for me to be good at it, I want to learn a little bit. I wasn't even sure how to start. The sherry non really was a cheat. Itaka nodded. There are few who truly master it as it requires precise chakra control, he says. Is there something in particular you wanted to learn? He spoke casually, but Itaka so rarely entertained questions about ninja techniques that I had to pause and squint at him suspiciously. Well. I said. I want to know how to hide. Itaka nodded. I see, he said. He paused. You haven't been sleeping well. I winced. It's just bad dreams, I muttered. Itaka looked sad but didn't press further. He'd remained gently persistent when questioning me about the incident, but I rebuffed all of his attempts to coax out what had happened. In the end, he reluctantly agreed to let it go as long as I promised to be careful. Genjutsu involves the introduction of chakra into the central nervous system of a target with the intent of mimicking and interrupting biological signals sent to and from the brain, Itaka began. I blinked because I hadn't actually expected Itaka to agree to teach me right away. All genjutsu are performed using yin release and can have a wide variety of effects from paralysis, to emotional manipulation, to the standard illusionary constructs. But even at the highest level, Almost any genjutsu can be broken by a ninja with 99% or higher chakra control efficiency. While not common in the field, ninja with that level of chakra control do exist, which means that a genjutsu user must always have additional methods of handling a target. And that was the real reason genjutsu specialists were so uncommon. It was rare for shinobi to have an affinity for it, difficult to learn when they did, and even at the highest level, it could still be beaten, leaving the shinobi with nothing to show for it. Genjutsu was very much an all-or-nothing style of fighting. When it worked, it was effectively a low-cost, vast-range, one-hit KO. When it didn't, it was nothing. Kurane would make it to Jounin as a genjutsu specialist, and for all her hard work, she wouldn't even be a speed bump against Itaka. What if you don't want to fight and just want to hide? I asked. I didn't want to hurt anyone. I just wanted the ability to slip away. Sometimes, Itaka paused. Sometimes confrontations cannot be avoided. However, Genjutsu is an extremely useful tool for lowering the frequency significantly. The technique I want to show you today is called the blind spot technique. It focuses on creating an artificial blind spot. When used against an unsuspecting target, it can allow the user to pass unnoticed. Itaka went on to explain the brain chemistry and sketched a diagram of the occipital lobe, going into great detail about where and how to insert chakra. After a long-winded explanation, Itaka showed me the hand signs required for projecting my chakra toward him, and I gave it a shot. Interacting with Itaka's chakra was strange. He wasn't fighting back simply allowing me to poke and prod at his chakra as I felt my way through his mind. He guided me easily, able to sense my clumsy progress. I was very, very careful as I found the nerves he'd nudged me toward and blocked them. That's very good, Kiyo-chan, said Itaka. I cut the technique and slumped to one side. Itaka caught me easily. Hey, hey, are you okay? Suzuki asked. I blinked up at him. She's only tired, said Itaka, which was good because now that I wasn't focused on the genjutsu, I realized exactly how much I needed a nap. It looks like you've already mastered leaf sticking. That's very impressive. Let me show you the next stage. I closed my eyes and dozed off in his lap. Learning the genjutsu was the easy part. Mastering the genjutsu was the hard part. At my current level, the blind spot genjutsu took seven hand signs and five minutes of careful maneuvering through the target's brain before I could vanish from their sight. And once I had them under the blind spot genjutsu, I could only hold it for another minute before my chakra ran out. Then Itaki helpfully demonstrated exactly how easily he could shatter it with a casual flare of chakra, making all of my hard work for naught. It wasn't the most encouraging start, 
but I was still hyped from the overwhelming fact that I could cast a genjutsu. This was so amazingly cool that I rode an emotional high for an entire week. When I told Asumi Obachan about Itaka's genjutsu lessons, she decided to test my progress with chakra control, and at the end she declared me adequate to start basic medical ninjutsu training. Medical internships typically begin after a shinobi has become a genin, said Asumi Obachan. I would normally never have approved this, but your father was quite insistent. I began taking shifts at the Uchiha Clinic, a small medical facility that worked closely with the police department. Suzuki tagged along exactly once out of curiosity, but since Asumi Obachan did not allow idle hands in her clinic, he quickly decided that he had better things to do, like shuriken training. I spent most of my shift working in the clinic and received 30 minutes a day of private tutelage on chakra healing techniques, though Asumi Obachan expressly forbade me from using medical techniques on others until I received my medical license. Itaka didn't have a license, so he'd technically broken the law when he'd healed me after the confrontation with the genin. Not that I was about to mention that to anyone. I was also allowed to watch examinations and procedures being performed. Asumi Obachan taught me how to use standard medical seals and gave me a stack of medical books that was almost as tall as I was. It was daunting, but I accepted the books and got to work. It was a good way to spend the winter. After three months, Asumi Obachan deemed me ready to attempt a healing technique on an injured fish that was kept alive by a very specialized life support seal. Pop quizzes were always nerve-wracking, but I worked my way methodically through the fish's circulatory system and identified the issue, suffocation. I slowly, carefully coaxed oxygen to flow through its body, and the fish began to flop around. Asumi Obachan hummed in approval and said that I was coming along nicely. It was serious progress even if my weapons training was still lacking. Your aim is getting really good, but you should practice on moving targets more, said Suzuki. I could hit three stationary targets simultaneously with both Kunao and Shuriken, but Suzuki had advanced to three moving targets. He casually flipped a Kunao in his hand before giving it a lazy overhand throw and landing it dead center in the smallest, hardest to reach target. You should play ninja sometime. I promise I'll keep the others from picking on you. It was hardly necessary at this point. As many of our cousins grew closer to their graduation, they'd started caring less about playing ninja and started caring more about being ninja. They were constantly talking about when they would take the chinin exams, become police officers just like their parents, and bring honor to our clan's name. They were growing up now. But they would never grow old. I don't like hitting people, I said with a shrug and an experimental sniff. I was currently using a decongestant ninjutsu to hide the fact that I had a cold. Not even Mikato had noticed. Earlier this morning, I overheard her talking happily to Fugaku about my recent bout of improved health. I felt somewhat guilty for the deception, but she'd spent years worrying over me. She deserved a break. It was just a cold. But how are you going to become a great police officer if you don't want to fight? Suzuki asked. He rolled his eyes as if that was a rhetorical question. But it did have an answer. Because I wouldn't. I would never grow old either. The reality of our situation was easy to forget sometimes, but the tournament portion of Itaka's Chinin exam was a stark reminder of exactly what my gentle older brother was capable of. I hadn't really wanted to see Itaka fight. I knew the massacre was coming, but it was easier to push those thoughts aside when the person responsible seemed so kind and harmless. The illusion had been shattered as I watched Itaka use Genjutsu to torture a cloud genin named Nimui. The boy just screamed. And screamed. And screamed. Eventually Nimui forfeited, his words barely audible between sobs of terror. In the stands, only Danzo applauded, and Itaka became a genin. Afterwards, I couldn't quite meet Itaka's eyes, the same eyes that would one day torture Suzuki, the same eyes that would make Suzuki scream too. Before I could come up with a suitable response, Fugaku slid open the door and stepped outside. Tio san 
you're home early. Said Suzuki, running up to greet Fugaku. Yes, I have some news for you, he said, looking both serious and mildly pleased. I've enrolled the two of you in the academy next year. Suzuki gasped, and his face lit up. Really? Suzuki asked. Fugaku nodded, giving him the barest hint of a smile. Your mother and I believe that you're both ready, he said. You're also old enough to learn the clan fighting style. I did not like the sound of that. It sounded like a whole lot of pain. Fugaku didn't waste any time in proving me right either. He demonstrated a small series of basic attacks. Then he squared Suzuki and me off against one another in the backyard. I looked at Suzuki. Suzuki looked at me. He took a step forward, and I flinched. Suzuki hesitated, looking uncertain. I thought that maybe I should attack, but there was something fundamentally wrong about punching a five-year-old. Suzuki seemed to be thinking something along those lines too. I don't want to hit Kiyo-chan, mumbled Suzuki. I'd never seen him object to Fugaku before, and Fugaku seemed nonplussed by the quavering protest. You can learn from each other or you can learn from your enemies when they attempt to kill you, said Fugaku. That wasn't totally fair. The academy would teach us how to fight. But I could see his point as well. Nii Chan, it's okay if you hit me, I said quietly. I did not particularly want to be on the receiving end of a punch, but Fugaku was right in every way that mattered. I knew what Suzuki would face one day. He needed to learn. And if it meant a little pain on my part, well it was nothing compared to what he would endure later. After about a full minute of awkward tension, Suzuki gave the slowest, most half-hearted strike I'd ever seen. He barely ruffled the front of my shirt before drawing back and looking again at Fugaku. I let out a slow breath and gave a half-hearted punch that mirrored Suzuki's, all its power aborted at the end so that none of the force touched him. Fugaku nodded once, his face unreadable. Again, he said. Violence really was a learned habit. Suzuki and I did more dodging than hitting for those first few weeks as we assessed each other's speed and reflexes, learning exactly when to pull back and how much force could be safely used. Fugaku rarely had time for us, instead telling us to practice a series of kicks and punches that he had taught us while under Mikato's watchful eye. Mikato was not a Taijutsu expert, but this was academy level at best, and she was more than competent enough to correct our stances and offer advice. Other than that, sparring with Suzuki wasn't as terrible as I'd feared. He was naturally better than me, but he didn't push me around. While I'd seen him mercilessly take down other kids during games of ninja, he was always conscientious of his strength and my limits. And when I was ready to stop, he stopped too. It was actually going really well until I passed out during a training session and woke up in the hospital due to a rare chakra-eating infection exacerbated by strenuous exercise while having a cold. Mikato was quietly crying at my bedside. Eventually I reached a respectable mastery of the blind spot genjutsu with a half-second casting time and a five-minute duration. Even Suzuki, who was now familiar with genjutsu and the breaking of genjutsu, could not escape from it easily. Excellent progress, said Fugaku when I demonstrated it over dinner one night. Asumio Bachan has high praise for your contributions at the clinic as well. My contributions were mostly washing sheets and cleaning glassware, but it was nice to be appreciated. Ah, Tio-san, said Suzuki hesitantly. Do you want to see my shurikenjutsu? And I'm getting really good with my bow. Maybe after dinner, said Fugaku. How is your reading coming along? I'm almost done with Samurai Asahi, said Suzuki. Yes, that's one of Kiyo-chan's old chapter books, said Fugaku. I suppose that is an adequate reading level for your age. Suzuki looked down at his plate. It seemed that my academic successes were throwing another shadow for Suzuki to fall in. Nii-chan will be the best at the academy, I said because he would be. He would be rookie of the year and a prodigy. 
he just wasn't a prodigy among prodigies like Ataku. I bet he'll have the best shuriken jutsu in the whole class. No, the whole school. Suzuki looked up, and gave me a tentative smile across the table. Perhaps, said Fugaku, setting down his chopsticks. Well, show me your progress then. But there was a knock on the door, and a police officer entered, kneeling and apologizing for the interruption. There was a copper-scented stain on her left sleeve, though she didn't seem injured. It's all right, said Fugaku. We'll talk in my office. He looked down at Suzuki. Maybe later. Okay. Said Suzuki, watching him go. I couldn't exactly fault Fugaku for prioritizing a blood-splattered police officer, but Suzuki was too young to understand. Nii-chan, maybe you can help me with shuriken jutsu while it's still light out, I said. And afterwards, do you want to read together? Nii-san is better. Whispered Suzuki, low enough that Mikato couldn't hear. I couldn't exactly argue against that. Itaka was better than everyone at pretty much everything. Except. I want to learn from you, I said firmly. Suzuki looked up, startled. You're always helping me out no matter how far behind I am. You're patient, and you don't mind showing me things over and over again if I don't get it right. I don't want another teacher. I want you, because to me, you're the best. And you always will be. So let's train together, okay? Suzuki flushed and smiled. Yeah, he said, and he followed me into the yard. Kiyo-chan. Mikato called out as I slipped on my shoes. Your father forgot his lunch. Can you drop it off on your way to the clinic? Yes, Kaya-chan, I said, taking the cloth-wrapped box and sliding it into my bag. I love you, bye. The clinic connected to the police station, so it hardly qualified as a detour. I pushed open the door to the police headquarters and the secretary at the front desk looked up at me. He activated his sherry non and looked me over before flicking it off a moment later, content that I wasn't using genjutsu or a disguise to infiltrate the building. I passed through the general intake area where various villagers were waiting in long lines to meet with harried looking police officers. Why should I answer questions to a worthless traitor? Slurred a drunken man as I slipped past the desk into the employee's only area. The room was laced with tension as the belligerent man raised his voice and lurched to his feet. Bunch of cowards, all of you. He took a swing at one of the officers. But before the blow could connect, the officer slammed him into the floor. Another officer was there to herd the other villagers away from the fight as the man was carried toward the temporary holding cells to sober up. There were grumbles among the other villagers at the display, and it didn't sound like it was in the Uchiha's favor. I heard more than one person whisper about brutality and arrogance. I retreated up the stairs towards the main office area. As I rounded the corner, another one of my distant relatives exited Fugaku's office. He glanced at me with his sherry non and smiled. And, in a moment of distraction, he left the door slightly ajar as he hurried off with a stack of papers. As I approached, I heard a familiar voice through the crack, and I paused in the hallway. They've accepted you into Umbu. Fugaku asked. Danso-sama requested me, said Itaku. He will give me an assignment to determine my readiness for the position. Fugaku hummed in thought. Perhaps this is for the best, he said. With the situation between the clan and the elders in its current state, something must be done. You will act as the bridge between the clan and the village. But remember this, Itaki, you are first and foremost a member of the Uchiha clan. All other loyalties to Umbu and Kanaha are nothing compared to that. Do you understand? Yes, said Itaki. Good, said Fugaku. Then he raised his voice a fraction. Kiyo-chan, come in. I winced at being caught, but I'd never really doubted that they'd known I was there. It wasn't like I was sneaking. Okay, I said, pushing open the door and holding up the lunch like a peace offering. 
you forgot your lunch. Fugaku nodded, and I placed it on his desk. I was about to escape, but I stopped. There was nothing I could do to stop the coup. I was too young, too powerless, to do anything but watch. Tio Yu Chan, the people downstairs, they were saying things about our clan. They called us traitors and cowards. Fugaku gave me a sharp look, but I plowed on. They're wrong, aren't they? We wouldn't do anything to hurt Kanaha. It's our home too, right? Fugaku's face turned dark, but then he sighed. The words of criminals are meaningless, he said, which wasn't exactly a no. You should hurry to the clinic, Kiyo-chan. Asumio Bachan will wonder where you are. Close the door on your way out. I could guess at what they wanted to talk about. Itaka's induction into Umbu might be an open secret, but having him spying on the village would not be. When I looked to him, Itaka's face was completely blank. I fled. Suzuki, Itaka and I made the most of our last bit of free time before entering the academy by training together out in the woods. Well, Suzuki and Itaka trained while I watched. I made an occasional effort to replicate their throwing techniques, but Suzuki had long since left me behind in terms of skill, and Itaka's abilities bordered on magic. Compared to them, I was a fumbling child. Still, I tried to make the most of it, and they never actively excluded me no matter how vast the difference in our abilities. Our training was brought to an abrupt end, however, when Suzuki hurt his ankle and Itaki opted to carry him home. When we arrived, Fugaku was waiting for us with a frown and told us to come inside. You are my son after all, said Fugaku after mentioning a mission presented by the village elders. He looked at Itaki seriously. Only such a short time after raising your status to Chinin, you've come this far. For tomorrow's special mission, I've decided to come along. Suzuki startled. Tomorrow was the academy entrance ceremony. If the mission succeeds, Itaka, your enrollment into Umbu is almost guaranteed, said Fugaku, and his smile was not entirely pleasant. I felt the twist in Fugaku's chakra as he activated his sherry non. Do you understand? Was that a threat? The sherry non was used to see through illusions, measure reactions, and sometimes to record happy memories, but it wasn't exactly polite to use it in normal conversation with someone. You don't have to worry so much, said Itaki, glancing over at Suzuki. Besides. Um, Tio Yusan, tomorrow is Kiyo-chan's and my. Suzuki began. Tomorrow's mission is not only for you, but also a very important mission for the Uchiha clan, said Fugaku. Considering the tension between the clan and the village, I could see why he might not consider a simple ceremony to be high priority. Perhaps one missed ceremony might not have been a big deal, but Suzuki wouldn't see it that way. Because it wasn't just one ceremony. It was every single time Fugaku had prioritized something else over him. Suzuki stared down at the floor, disappointed but not surprised. I guess I'll refuse tomorrow's mission after all, said Itaka. What are you saying? Fugaku demanded. Have you lost your mind? You should know how important tomorrow is. Of course he knew. That's why he was using it as a bargaining chip. I'll go to Suzuki and Kiyo-chan's academy entrance ceremony tomorrow, he said, staring Fugaku down. It's customary for relatives to go to the ceremony. You received a notification, didn't you, Tio Yusan? Was Itake blackmailing Fugaku? Pay attention to Suzuki or I will ruin your plans to put a spy into Umbu. And it was for Suzuki's sake. I never tried to gain Fugaku's attention. I felt guilty enough for stealing so much of our parents' time and energy away from Suzuki even without trying to take more. But Suzuki never made a secret of his deep desire for Fugaku's recognition. The fact that Fugaku couldn't even see it was a sign of how overlooked Suzuki really was. Fugaku stood up looking like he'd swallowed a lemon. I get it, he said. I'll go to the academy. Point to attack it. 
Fugaku was the first to leave, his expression still dark over having lost to his eldest child. Only when he was gone did Itaki rise, lowering a hand to help Suzuki stand. Suzuki still looked troubled. So did Itaki, but for slightly different reasons. Ani I Chan. I said, but I stopped. Whatever mission Danzo had planned, it wouldn't be easy. Danzo was the sort of man to test a person's heart as well as their skills as a shinobi. Itaka would probably have to assassinate someone. That thought sent a chill down my spine. It wasn't that shinobi didn't kill people normally. Plenty of missions involved fights to the death, but assassination was different. The killing wasn't incidental to the mission. It was the mission. Itaka was a child. And Fugaku just didn't seem to care. No one seemed to care. Fugaku loved Itaka. I knew he did. So why? Why was he so content to put Itaka in mortal peril? Why did he command Itaka to kill so casually? Why was it always Itaka who had to sacrifice for the clan and the village? It wasn't fair. On your mission tomorrow, don't get hurt, okay? I asked, my voice trembling. It was a foolish fear. Itaka, even as a chinin, could handle anyone below cage level. And if Fugaku wasn't at his side, it would be Shisui. Between the two of them, they could probably match even a cage. Besides that, my request was silly. No one went on missions intending to get hurt. But I had to voice my feelings somehow, this deep desire of wanting to shelter him, even the tiniest bit, when no one else seemed willing to try. It was meaningless. What could I do to protect someone like Itaka? Still, Itaka's expression softened. I'll try, he said. And he left it at that. Chapter 7, Old Friends and Enemies I wasn't really sure what to expect from the academy. The opening ceremony was nice. Fugaku reluctantly attended and stood at the back while the Hokage gave a speech about the importance of learning and growing into fine shinobi. Afterwards, the teachers lined up and started calling out the names of the students in their classes one by one. With each name called, I grew more and more nervous. What if they put Suzuki and me in different classes? But my fears were for nothing as one of the chinin called out Uchiha Kiyo, Uchiha Suzuki, Uzumaki Naruto. I let out a quiet breath of relief and smiled at Naruto as we approached the group together. He smiled back, a little hesitant. I still wasn't sure if we could be friends, but surely it wouldn't be suspicious if I was cordial. If the Hokage wanted to keep the Uchiha away from Naruto, he wouldn't put us in the same class, right? Right. The Chinin who had called us was a robust man with a goatee named Funo Dekoku. He led us into his classroom, and I sat near the back with Suzuki on one side and Naruto on the other. This wasn't totally surprising since most of the other children radiated a thinly veiled aura of apprehension and mistrust when Naruto passed them by. I was, I noticed, the only person who had actually smiled at him. Once we'd completed the introductions, we were given an aptitude test to measure our academic strengths and weaknesses. I blazed through it easily because most questions were things like circle the kunao and 2 plus 4 equals, but there were outliers such as color the light bulb filament chartreuse which seemed designed to identify geniuses and cheaters. After finishing, I turned my paper over and peeked at Suzuki who was doing well and at Naruto who was, not. His paper was almost completely blank, and his eyes were roving over the words, desperately looking for something. I realized with a jolt that he still couldn't read. A quick glance around the room showed that he wasn't the only one either. The clanborn children seemed to be doing fine, but the civilian children tended to look nervous. There were a few notable exceptions, of course, like Sakura, who had already finished and was sitting quietly with her hands folded on her piece of paper and Shikamaru, who was sleeping on a blank test. Eventually Naruto started to guess wildly, obviously hoping to get something right by accident. When Dekoku came around to collect the papers, he smiled at mine and Suzuki's and frowned at Naruto's, making no comment. 
When recess was called, a few of the kids near us began whispering, wondering if Suzuki and I were as skilled as they'd heard because we were Uchiha. Unfortunately, this did nothing to help Suzuki's inferiority complex. Living up to one person's expectations was one thing. Living up to the expectations of an entire village? I could understand why he wanted to spend recess practicing with Shuriken. The afternoon was dedicated to Taijutsu classes which consisted of a lot of stretching, exercising, and punching padded posts. My stamina put me at the bottom of the class. Most of the other children could run circles around me on the track. Literally in the case of Naruto and Kiba. It didn't help when my asthma flared up yet again, and Deiko could put me on the bench while everyone else continued exercising. This, at least, allowed me to observe the others. I noticed plenty of poor form, lopsided stances, and general apathy. To my dismay, Naruto fell near the very bottom of the class in just about everything except stamina. That boy was a never-ending font of energy. I got tired just watching him. Eventually Deikoku dismissed us for the day, and we all headed home. Dinner turned out to be surprisingly tense. Itaka looked oddly blank, and when Fugaku made vague allusions to how things went, he responded with an equally generic they went well which seemed to be enough. Before bed, I made sure to give him a long hug. Umbu was no place for a child. I just wished that someone anyone else felt that way too. There was no celebration commemorating Itaka's new position, and Itaka never spoke about it. He simply added the standard umbu vest, arm guards, leg guards, and sword to his daily outfit. I knew he would be fine. He was Itaka, after all. But I still felt a little anxious about his new role. There was no way out for him. He would do his duty to the clan and to the village no matter the cost to himself, no matter how much it hurt his pacifistic heart. He would do it for those he cared about. He would do this and more. But he was still just a child. One day a week, the class was divided into Kunoichi class and Shinobi class. A big part of being a ninja was being able to infiltrate foreign places and hide in plain sight. Kunoichi tended to be disguised as performers, maids, and noble ladies. So Kunoichi lessons were like a ninja-themed home economics class. Shinobi, on the other hand, tended to be disguised as day laborers to explain their often very noticeable muscles. According to Suzuki, Shinobi classes revolved around trades like construction, sales, and general contract work. This time away from Suzuki was a prime opportunity for me to make friends, but I hesitated. It was tempting, especially with the girls whose names and fates I already knew. Ino was bold. Sakura was sweet. Hinata was shy. I thought it might be nice to have a friend. But, as always, the looming massacre hung over my head. As much as I wanted to reach out, I didn't want any of them to miss me when I was gone. So I remained polite but distant, ever wary of getting too close. Kunoichi classes were taught by a Kunoichi named Suzu Sensei and usually ended about an hour earlier than the Shinobi classes. Apparently the boys had a midday break so that they weren't working outside during the hottest part of the day, and they had to make up the time in the afternoon. While all the other girls ran home, I found a grassy spot under a tree to wait for Suzuki. I had just cracked open a book when I felt Chakra approaching. Familiar Chakra. It sent a bolt of panic through my heart. I looked up to see the genin, the same genin who had beaten me up a year and a half ago. I was on my feet in an instant, but he closed the distance before I could escape. He snatched at my hair, pulling me toward him with a twisted smirk. Well, well, if it isn't the Uchiha brat, he said. I haven't seen you around the park at all, but my little brother said he saw you on the school playground yesterday. You didn't even look at him. He was so heartbroken, you know. I stopped struggling as every movement was met by a vicious tug on my hair. From this angle I could see a cluster of mismatched objects hanging from his sash. Among the trinkets was a pale blue, frayed, and stained ribbon matching the one tied neatly in my hair. Trophies, 
I realized. I felt heat rising in my cheeks and clenched my fists. How dare he? How dare he? I tried to push him away, but he sidestepped and wrenched my head sideways, pulling out stands of hair and making my neck pop alarmingly. I cried out in pain, but the park was empty. There was no one to hear. You know, my ribbon's getting a little worn out, he said thoughtfully. But look. Yours still looks pretty good. What do you say you hand it over? Hey. Startled, the genin released me, but the shout was only a teacher calling out to someone else in the distance. Still, it was the momentary distraction I needed. I flew through the hand signs for the blind spot genjutsu and darted out of his line of sight before sprinting full tilt back home. When I arrived, I retreated up into my room before Mikato could see me and fixed my hair. Thankfully I had no injuries this time, and sending a bit of healing chakra to my scalp eased the pain. When Suzuki came home later that night, he complained about me not waiting for him. He said he looked all over the park before realizing I wasn't there. Sorry, Nii Chan, I mumbled, unable to meet his eyes. Suzuki would have put up a much better fight. I, wasn't feeling well. Well, I guess it's okay, he said, placing his hand on my forehead to check my temperature and frowning with worry. It's still kinda cold out. So don't do anything that'll make you sick. Yeah, sorry, I said. I felt guilty for worrying him. But what else could I say? I dragged my feet to school the next day, but nothing happened. I spent the entire morning stuck to Suzuki's side like we were doing some bizarre variation of the leaf-sticking chakra control exercise. He noticed the odd clinginess, but he didn't push the issue when I said it was nothing. At lunch I tried to find the genin's younger brother, but with a couple hundred kids running around and no idea what he looked like now, I didn't have much luck. I made it through most of the next week without incident. I couldn't be sure, but I thought that the genin wanted to wait until I was alone. When he'd first attacked Naruto and me, we'd been in a deserted park, and he'd attacked me again when I was alone after school. If the genin's brother really was watching us while we played, he had to know that Suzuki would protect me. Suzuki, even at this age, was about as skilled as a genin. He would have no trouble when getting into a real fight. Me. Not so much. It was a little strange to think of a small child as being a credible threat to an actual ninja, but Itaki had proven that age didn't factor into skill or lethality. He'd made his first kill at four. Assuming that young was the same as weak was a good way to die. During the next Kunoichi class I was a nervous wreck. I should have felt more shame in hiding behind a six-year-old, but I wasn't sure what else to do. I thought about asking a teacher, but word would get back to my parents. And my clan. I couldn't let that happen. As I'd predicted, the genin was waiting for me after Kunoichi class, but I saw him first as I lingered in the doorway. It gave me time to run through the hand signs, and I managed to slip away using the blind spot genjutsu, leaving him waiting with an anticipatory smirk. The next week, he was there with a scowl, but now that I knew where to look, I did it again. On the third week, I didn't even see him in the yard, but I cast the genjutsu in a wide net and slipped away just in case he was hiding. By the fourth week, I was sure that I'd won that he'd grown bored of trying to catch me. I stepped out into the open and darted toward the gate. I was nearly there when the genin popped out of hiding, snagging my arm and slamming me against the tree. Gotcha, Uchiha Brad, he said. He didn't knock me unconscious this time, but he nearly managed to pull out my ribbon. Thankfully, I tied it with a knot that was not easily undone, and he had to abandon his attempt when Suzu Sensei rounded a corner. The genin vanished as though he'd never been there at all. I asked Suzu Sensei if I could wait inside for my brother, but she told me that she had a shift at the Hokage Tower and couldn't leave me inside unattended. The next week, I thought about asking Ino and Sakura if they wanted to hang out after class so that I wouldn't be alone, but I couldn't risk putting anyone else in danger. 
The trophies on the Genin sash indicated that I was not his only target, and there was no way I was dragging a couple of children into danger. Still, I tried to hide amidst the other girls, using safety in numbers as we hurried home. But the Genin didn't have any problems following me, and there were plenty of secluded areas between the academy and the Uchiha district where he could ambush me. I wasn't strong enough to hold the blind spot technique for the entire journey, and I only felt safe when I'd made it home. It seemed like there was no escape from this. It wasn't an unfamiliar feeling. If there was one positive thing about my situation, though, it was that my genjutsu mastery was growing in leaps and bounds. The genin caught onto my genjutsu trick by the fifth week, but my control and focus frequently allowed me to escape even when he fought against my illusion. I was also getting much better at sensing him and could sweep my surroundings to locate his chakra signature in seconds. Once I'd located him, I could put him under genjutsu without him realizing it. I only needed 30 seconds or so to escape from the schoolyard. It worked most of the time. Unfortunately, the stress gave me a particularly virulent flu and a stomach ulcer that knocked me flat on my back for two straight months, a small blessing as it meant that I didn't have to deal with the genin. I didn't even try to mask my symptoms this time, though I knew I couldn't hide under my covers forever. Back at home, Itaka would vanish on missions, sometimes for a day and sometimes for a week or more at a time. I could always tell when he'd taken an out-of-village mission because his face was strangely blank when he returned home, as if he'd been suppressing his emotions and hadn't quite remembered to turn them back on again. In the beginning, all it would take was a shouted Uni Ai Chan. To make him smile, but as time wore on, I began to notice a change. It was subtle, but Itaka smiled less and less. His eyes didn't light up the way they usually did when he looked at Suzuki and me. Instead there was a quiet melancholy and blank emptiness where the light used to be. It was worrying, especially because he had only been in Umbu for a few months. Itaka was gone for his twelfth birthday, but when he returned I had a whole pile of dango waiting for him along with a medical kit I'd put together with the help of the clinic workers. It was vanishingly rare for him to be injured, and at this point it took nothing less than an entire team of Umbu to put a scratch on him. But I still felt better knowing that he had medical supplies on hand if he needed them. Suzuki's birthday was a little trickier. He was turning seven, so this was his last birthday before the massacre. I spent a few weeks going over what I should give him. It had to be something practical that he would need after everyone else had been killed. But I didn't want it to seem like a lame gift to a kid. For instance socks might be useful, but no seven-year-old appreciated unwrapping socks on their birthday. What Suzuki would need most after the massacre was something to remember us by. It took a bit of pleading with Mikato, but I received access to a clan camera. Cameras were a little strange in this world. They were big, bulky things like something out of the Victorian era. Considering how secretive ninja were, I supposed it was to be expected that small, lightweight, easily concealable cameras hadn't been invented yet. But I carted the camera around for days taking pictures of our entire clan around the grounds, all of them smiling and some holding up banners that said happy birthday Suzuki. I then managed to get a whole family picture of us, Itaki included, and went to put them together in a small photo album. On his birthday, Suzuki appreciated the album, but he was more eager to play with the new giant shuriken Mikato had gotten him. I didn't mind. The shuriken would help protect him in a fight, and I thought Suzuki would appreciate the album more when he was older. My birthday came with a huge stack of books from everyone. Most of them were medical texts from Fugaku and Mikato with slightly grim reminders to work hard and listen to Asumio Bachan. Itaka gave me a book on barrier seals. And Suzuki gave me the latest Kumi Kunoichi novel that had only come out last month. She's a little old for that, don't you think? Fugaku said. Your sister needs to focus on her studies and put away childish things like this. Suzuki's face fell and he flushed red with embarrassment. But I love Kumi Kunoichi, I said. True, 
the storylines were childish and the writing wasn't exactly award-winning, but the stories were fun and upbeat. I promise I won't fall behind on my studies, Tio Yu Chan. Hmm, well I suppose it's all right then, he admitted, glancing between the bland textbooks and the colorful cover of the chapter book. I nudged Suzuki who gave me a sidelong look. I really like it, Nii Chan, I whispered. Thank you. Suzuki's lips quirked into a small smile, and he nodded. Unfortunately, happy times couldn't last forever. After returning to class, Suzuki began eyeing me suspiciously when I paused in the door at lunch, habitually scanning the schoolyard for the genin. Tomorrow was Kunoichi class, and the genin had caught me last week. I'd hoped that my two-month classroom hiatus would deter him, but apparently someone had let him know of my return to school. Is something wrong? Suzuki asked, snapping me out of my thoughts. I'm fine, I said. I was just looking for a good place to sit. Right, he said. Suzuki was still at that age where kids tended to believe what they were told. It made things easier. We sat down and unpacked our food. You know, you can tell me if there's something wrong, Kiyo Chan. Or not. There's nothing wrong, really, I said, smiling to alleviate his worried frown. There was nothing Suzuki could do. As good as he was, there was no way I was going to ask my seven year old brother to help me against an actual ninja. If there ever came a time when I was willing to put a child in danger just to save myself, that would be a good indication that I no longer deserved to live. Would you like my tomato? Suzuki took my tomato wordlessly, and we sat together until the bell rang. Early the next morning, Itaki returned from a mission. As usual, he seemed cold and disinterested, though when I cuddled up to his side, he allowed it. You're not wearing your ribbon, he observed with slightly narrowed eyes. It's in my room, I said. The genin hadn't taken it, but I didn't want to risk losing another one. I'd stopped wearing it on Kunoichi class days, but so far no one had noticed the change. I see, said Itaki. Do you want to talk about it? He might not have known what it was, but with the way I was clinging to his middle, it was pretty clear that something was wrong. I'm fine. I said. Really, my problems were nothing compared to his. Itaka didn't look convinced, but Mikato called us inside for breakfast before he could ask more. The day passed both very quickly and very slowly. But the afternoon arrived soon enough, and I stood in the alcove as the other girls raced home. I reached out with my chakra sense, scanning the genin's usual hiding places. I couldn't sense him so he was probably waiting to ambush me along the way home like he'd done last week. If I sprinted to the market two streets over, I would have enough chakra to use the blind spot technique in the isolated areas on the way home. Unfortunately, halfway across the schoolyard, I felt the sickeningly familiar chakra, and the genin leaped down from a tree. Had he learned how to suppress his chakra? I didn't have time to dodge as he reached for me, throwing my arms up for what little protection they would offer. Hey, Uchiha brat, you didn't even try to hide this time, he mocked as I staggered to a halt. I braced for his painful touch. But it never came. Cautiously, I peeked out from between my arms to see the genin's hand inches away from my face. His wrist was caught by another hand. My eyes traced upwards from the hand to the grey bracer to the grey umbu vest, and finally to attack his face, his eyes narrowed in quiet threat. The genin half turned with a scowl to see who had interrupted him. Itaka was only 12 years old and several inches shorter than the genin, but the other boy still took notice of at Itaka's attire, his full umbu garb sends the mask and the long-handled blade slung across his back. If I hadn't been nearly sick with anxiety, the speed with which his face went from smug superiority to oh, shit would have been funny. Itaka, his eyes red with the sherry non, took a long moment to stare down the genin before slowly lowering his gaze to the boy's sash, to where my old, tattered ribbon was still on display. Then his eyes flicked up, and his grip on the boy's wrist visibly tightened. 
The air was thick with intent, not quite killing intent, but not far from it either. Itaki reached up with his other hand and pulled my ribbon free from the boy's sash. You will never lay your hands on my little sister again, he said. He spoke softly, evenly, as if stating that the sky was blue or that the sun would rise in the east. The genin looked ready to wet his pants. Aye aye. The boy stuttered, but he was silenced with another look. Itaki held him for a moment longer before releasing him. Run. And run he did, screaming all the way. Itaki, eyes still red and narrowed, watched him flee, and I knew that this wasn't over. But for now Itaki only considered my old ribbon before slipping it into his pocket. That was fine with me. The ribbon was old and stained and ruined. But I was happy, so, so happy, that the genin didn't have it anymore. I sniffed, and Itaki knelt beside me. From another pocket, he pulled out my other ribbon, the one I'd left in my room that morning. Without a word, he turned me around and carefully ran his fingers through my hair, pulling back my fringe and tying the ribbon into bow. Why didn't you tell me? He asked. Why indeed? Itaka was twelve years old. He was a child, and yet he had never been a child, had never been allowed to be a child. He'd killed at an age when most children played hide and seek. He'd borne the responsibilities of being the clan heir, the link between the Uchiha and the village, and the clan prodigy. And now he was a double agent for the village that would order his family massacred. He and Shisui were still trying to prevent the coup. They still believed they had a chance. I thought that Itaka might have realized the futility of his actions even now. It was written in his face, in the way he so rarely smiled anymore. The inevitable truth was carving deeper and deeper into his soul with every passing day. And I? I was just waiting to die. You've been working so hard, I said. And you always come home so sad. I didn't, I didn't want you to worry about me too. I didn't want to make things worse for you. Itaka let out a long breath, not quite a sigh. He laid his hand on my head and pulled me close. You have never made things worse for me, Kiyo-chan, he said. I sniffled again as he stroked my hair soothingly. You're all right now. You're all right. And he held me until I was. Chapter 8, Goodbye. Pneumonia again. I looked up from my notes to see Itaka standing in the hospital room door. He was still in full umbu garb, but without the mask or sword. Weapons weren't allowed in the hospital. With so many shinobi in vulnerable states, it made everyone feel better to leave them at the door. Not that Itaka needed a sword to kill someone. Yeah, I picked it up from one of the patients at the clinic, I said. Kaya-chan thinks that I shouldn't be working around sick people, only injured people. That way I'd get sick less. But Tio yu chan said that my training is important for the clan. If they really wanted to go through with the coup, they needed trained medics in case things went wrong. It was probably the same reason Asumio Bachan was still practicing when she should have retired ten years ago. Everything was for the clan. I see, said Itaki, approaching my bed and taking a seat. How are you feeling? I've learned a neat healing trick, I said with a grin. If I run healing chakra through my body, it can mask symptoms of illness. So right now I feel fine, but I'm still technically sick and need to be monitored. I've been practicing a lot of medical ninjutsu. And other things. I shuffled my notes and set them aside. I had to make room on the bedside table, which was filled with an assortment of reflex toys provided by Shisui. He'd offered them as a trade to keep me entertained after I'd held him hostage for nine hours during my last hospital stay. I was getting pretty good at them, too. They kept me busy when I grew too tired to focus on reading, and even Shisui was impressed by my reaction times. If I was very, very focused, I could track Shisui's base speed with my eyes, which, according to him, was a pretty significant accomplishment for an academy student. I'm glad to see you're keeping busy, said Itaka, his eyes sweeping over the many scrolls and toys. 
Is there anything else you need? Anything I can bring you? Just you, I said. Books are nice, but visitors are better. It's a little lonely sometimes. Mikato and Suzuki came to visit me yesterday afternoon to deliver a box of Get Well Senbei rice crackers, and they'd probably drop by again in another day or two. I hadn't seen Fugaku since being admitted almost a week ago. I couldn't fault them for it. Hospital visits were just a fact of life now. I couldn't expect them all to visit every day, and I had plenty of books to keep me occupied. This was just normal. Nothing to fuss over. Routine. I'll see what I can do, said Itaki, which wasn't much of a promise. I couldn't exactly hold it against him either. He had his work with Umbu and his obligations to the clan, both of which took priority over social calls. How have things been at the academy? Better, I said. I'd seen the genin at the police station. The day after the incident, I'd gone to deliver Fugaku's forgotten lunch. The genin was in general intake with his hands tied behind his back. He was in tears as Yashiro berated him while brandishing the genin's sash of trophies. Yashiro was shouting that the genin would be stripped of his rank and would be tried for assaulting civilians and bringing disgrace to Kanaha. The genin had caught my eye and flinched. From his obvious fear, I thought that Itaka might have paid him an extra visit. The genin didn't look injured, but as the chinin exams had proven, Itaka's most horrific attacks left the body untouched. I didn't want to think about it. Oh, I wanted to ask you something, I said suddenly, turning to the bedside table and shuffling around for a book. I stopped when I heard a pair of voices from outside my room. The Uchiha is back again. Someone asked. After a moment, I recognized the chakra. It was Himari, one of the nurses who worked in this ward. Itaka turned, frowning at the still open door. Keep your voice down, and yes, she has pneumonia, said another nurse, Hina. Himari heaved a sigh. When she spoke again, she bit out each word in obvious frustration. I have twelve patients in critical condition, she snapped. I don't have time to babysit a high-maintenance clan heir just because she has a cold for the fifth time this month. The staff shortage is bad enough already. And I don't need to deal with the constant demands from her father. She paused, and when she spoke again, it was in a higher pitch with false cheer. Private room? Of course. We can't have an Uchiha mixing with common rabble. Catered food? Certainly. We can't have an Uchiha eating plain old hospital food. Triple checkups? Naturally. We can't have an Uchiha with a cough take a lower priority than our dying patients. Only the best for an Uchiha. I flinched at the vitriol she laced into my clan name. I hadn't even realized that I was getting such special treatment, Although now that I thought about it, private rooms and delicious food weren't exactly normal for public hospitals. And the nurses did seem to come around quite frequently. I wilted, sinking back into the pillows and drawing my blankets up to my chin. Himura was right. The hospital was overburdened. The Uchiha clinic was supposed to be primarily for the police force, but they'd been getting hospital overflow patients for months now due to the hospital being short-staffed. And here I was taking up an entire room not to mention the nurses' time and attention when they were obviously needed elsewhere. Please keep your voice down, Hina hissed. Fugaku-sama has been very generous to the hospital. Besides, she's only a child, and she has a weak immune system. Itaka stood up and approached the door. What she has is an egotistical clan, Himura shot back. Especially Fugaku-sama. Nothing is too good for his little princess. The Uchiha are all so arrogant. I can't stand. Itaka stepped out from the sliding door, and Himura's voice cut off abruptly. Itaka said something too quiet for me to hear, and Himura and Hina's chakra retreated hastily. Itaka waited until they were far down the hall before sliding the door closed with a click. Then he returned to his chair. Sorry, I said, though I couldn't quite say what I was apologizing for. 
you wanted to ask me something. He prompted. I hesitated. High maintenance. It's nothing, I mumbled. I already received so much special treatment. It was selfish to ask for more. Sorry. I pulled the sheets fully over my head. And Ataka gently pulled them back down. Tell me, he said, soft and patient. Well. I muttered, recognizing a losing battle when I heard one. I turned to the bedside table and picked up one of my books, a Kanaha travel guide. I flipped to the section on Kanaha beaches and showed him one with pristine white sand and sky blue water. Have you ever been here? He squinted at it and shook his head. Not to that beach, but I did see the ocean once, he said. Itaka closed his eyes briefly, and molded his chakra. When he opened them again, we were standing on a rocky outcropping with a vast sea beyond. The sky was overcast, and the air tasted like salt. I'd seen the ocean before in my previous life, but this wasn't a sandy tourist beach. It was a storm-swept landscape of jagged rocks and violent, crashing waves. Wow, it's so big, I said. I carefully made my way down to the water and slipped off my shoes. The water was cold but not freezing. The sea foam lapped at my heels as I splashed around in the surf and hunted for seashells. Itaka smiled as he sat down by a campfire on the rocks and watched me play. When I grew tired, I came to sit with him. It wasn't really fair that I could get tired in the illusion, as my real body had never moved from the hospital bed, but Genjutsu was funny like that. If the illusion felt real, the body made it real. Watch this, I said. I concentrated on Itaka's chakra in my mind, and I tweaked it ever so slightly. A stick skewered with marshmallows appeared in my hand. It worked. Itaki huffed a laugh. You've been studying, he said, producing his own marshmallow skewer and heating it over the fire. Well, I can't create big illusions like yours, I admitted. Just little ones like this. They're easier for me to picture. And I've been working on it for months so. So you should be able to do at least this much, right? He asked. I nodded. If anything my progress was a little lackluster. I was happier with my progress in medicine while I was equally embarrassed by my lack of progress in sealing. And I can't get the taste right, I said, biting into a marshmallow and scowling. Itaki handed me his skewer, and I took another bite. Yep, that was marshmallow all right. I felt the way his chakra moved to create the sensation until I was sure I could replicate it. Okay, now what about Dango? There were signs of tension growing around the clan. It had always been there, like lava bubbling beneath a crust of hardened stone, but now it was starting to peek through the cracks. Most of the clan huddled together, whispering and talking darkly, their words cutting off abruptly if I or any of the other children strayed too near. Asumio Bachan scheduled me to take the field medic exam, which would clear me for providing emergency medical response treatment to others. It was extremely unusual to give this to an academy student, but I could see the tightness in her shoulders and the worry in her pursed lips. If the coup was in motion and things went badly, they'd need as many medics on hand as possible, even half-trained ones like me. I passed with a perfect score which cleared me to perform standard field medicine on other people. I received a shiny certificate with my name written in pretty golden ink. As I looked at it, I couldn't help but feel a little sad. I'd spent years working toward mastering these techniques, and here was proof that I'd done my job well. But it was pointless. Everything would be pointless in the end. My evening internship work at the trauma center was brought to an end, as I was now certified and therefore not expected to wash glassware and change sheets. Instead I was given an hour of low-level rounds after school three days a week, making me the youngest field medic the clinic had ever employed. My hours were still limited, however, to account for my time at the academy, training, and the homework I was expected to do. I also received yet another staggering pile of study books in preparation for the full medic exam I would never take. 
I flipped through the titles and summaries, unenthused as I realized that there simply wouldn't be enough time to read them let alone learn from them before the end. At the academy, the teachers finally handed out the grades for the first half of the year. I scanned down the list. Because this was the academy, the scores were for ninjutsu, genjutsu, teijutsu, teamwork, and individual. Unsurprisingly, Suzuki took first in all subjects. In theory I should have had an edge in ninjutsu and genjutsu. I knew actual techniques while Suzuki still only knew the theory. But my inordinate number of sick days counted against me. Makeup tests could be given after class, but participation points could not. I still managed to score second place in ninjutsu and genjutsu. My individual and teamwork grades were high middle. And the less said about my teijutsu score, the better. Suzuki grinned as he scanned his report card. All his hard work had finally paid off. Fugaku would surely be proud of him now. Continue at this pace and become fine ninja like your brother, said Fugaku on reading the report cards. Suzuki's tentative smile faded. We waited a beat, but Fugaku merely stood up and turned to walk away. Nii Chan did an amazing job, though, didn't he, Tio Yu Chan? I asked, a little desperately. He worked so hard and all of our teachers talk about how impressive his shurikenjutsu and teijutsu are. And he's gotten first place in all of his subjects. Fugaku paused. I think you're going a little overboard with the praise, he said. Suzuki flinched, and Fugaku closed the door behind him, leaving us with a pair of neatly folded report cards on the floor. If Ataka wasn't on a mission, he was training. Sometimes he would be out late enough that Suzuki and I went looking for him. On one such evening, we found him standing with Shisui on a cliff overlooking waterfalls on the Naka River. It was a good place to have a conversation, the noise of the waterfalls obscuring softly spoken words without it looking as deliberate as a sound nullifying jutsu. Suzuki called out on seeing them and ran over. Nii san. Hey. Nii san. I trailed after, a little slower than Suzuki as Itaki asked us what we were doing out here. We, I began, but Suzuki cut me off. Hey, what were you two talking about anyway? He asked, apparently noting the slight distress on Itaki's face. I had a feeling I knew what was wrong. Come on, tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Itaki only smiled faintly. You're still too young to know about that, he said. Ah, what's that about? Suzuki pouted. What? I'm not part of the group now. When it came to talking about the coup, no he wasn't. He never had been. Itaki poked his forehead and told him, sorry, Suzuki. Next time. Suzuki only pouted more, which made Shisui huff a quiet laugh. Thankfully, Shisui deflected by saying that they were trying to decide who was stronger. You know the truth, don't you Suzuki? Shisui asked. That I'm stronger than him. It was a good act. Suzuki fell for it completely. My brother won't lose to you, Shisui. Said Suzuki, all confidence. He turned to attack it. Isn't that right? Nii san. Shisui, you. Said Itaki. He knew what Shisui was doing. Itaki had doubts about their ability to stop the coup. He knew exactly how badly their plans could go and what the cost would be. But they were strong, really, really strong. Itaki and Shisui were both cage level ninja along with Fugaku. The only other cage level ninjas were the third Hokage and Danzo. And even Danzo was only able to win against Shisui because of dirty tricks. If Shisui had gone into the fight with the intent to kill, he would have lived. And then what would have happened? I couldn't do anything. I couldn't change anything. I couldn't save anyone. And yet. There's only one way to settle this, I said seriously. Shuriken Jutsu competition. Nii Chan, could you get the targets please while we work out the rules? Yeah. Said Suzuki 
and he was off to get them from the trees in the nearby training field. I watched him go, waiting until he was well out of earshot. You're really bad at that, I told Itaka. Shisui and I san is much better at lying. If you're in Umbu, you should be better at it. You don't believe me? Shisui asked, raising his hand to his heart, stricken. It really was a good act, marred only by the playful light in his eyes. I wanted to play along, to stick out my tongue like a child and make bold claims that no one could fool me. I wanted to make him smile and laugh or maybe ruffle my hair at catching him in his game. I liked Chisui. He was sweet and patient and looked after Itaki in ways I could not. He didn't deserve what happened to him, what would happen to him. People in this world rarely did. This was the last time I would speak to him, and that thought alone killed any sense of levity. Shisui and Itaka caught my mood as I looked to my brother. I know why you've been sad, I said quietly, and Itaka's eyes sharpened. Something bad is going to happen between the village and the clan, isn't it? That's why everyone is so worried and angry. That's why we've been getting more weapons from Nekobath these past few years. That's why Asumio Bachan and Tio Yuchan want me to study medicine. Right. You noticed all of that, did you? Asked Chisui, his expression wry. It wasn't confirmation or denial, but I didn't exactly need either. I knew. Chisui knelt beside me and pulled me close. Look, nothing bad will happen. Itaki and I will make sure of it. So there's no need to be scared. But you and Uni I Chan and Tio Yu Chan are the most powerful people in the clan, I said. If the village knows, they'll want to make it so that you can't fight. They'll hurt you. They'll kill you. Don't you have any faith in us? Shisui asked, still playful but with a hint of seriousness too. I knew what would happen. I knew. You don't want to hurt anyone, I said, looking between them both. If you don't want to hurt them, and if they want to hurt you, you'll, you'll, you'll die. Shisui heaved a big sigh. He wasn't listening. We could leave. I said, panic creeping into my voice. We could go away. We don't have to fight. We could just go and, and. Kiyo-chan, said Itaki. He hesitated and looked away. We have nowhere else to go. This wasn't the Warring States period where nomadic ninja clans could simply pack up and move to better, safer locations. Maps were drawn. Villages were established. The Uchiha clan had been a mighty force in its prime, but against an entire hidden village, it was nothing. Itaka, Shisui, and Fugaku were not the standard. They were the rare geniuses. Most were like Mikato, who hadn't taken a mission in 15 years, like Asumio Bachan who had never been a fighter, or like Fumiko who had been injured and could no longer fight. No, we had nowhere to go. Another village might be willing to take in a few members with the promise of our bloodline, but no one would accept an entire clan that had betrayed their home village. No one would trust us, and any situation we came into would be exponentially worse than the one we'd left. Kanaha was the hill we would have to die on. Something of my thoughts must have shown on my face because Shisui pulled me into a hug. I don't want you to die, I said into his chest. I won't, he promised. Liar. He was too gentle, too kind. I wanted to protest, to fight. But then Suzuki returned with the targets, and Shisui stood a little straighter. Well, after much debate, I have to concede that Itaki is definitely stronger, said Shisui with a fixed smile. Ah! Suzuki moaned, having been robbed of a chance to see Itaki and Shisui in action. He protested, but Shisui laughed, throwing his hands up in faux defeat. Itaki only said that it was time to go home. Itaki took Suzuki and me by the hand and led us back to the main compound. I looked back in time to see Shisui staring at us with a contemplative expression, his mouth set in a determined line, and his eyes sherry non-red, etching this moment into his mind for the remainder of his life. Goodbye.
Shisui Nii san, I said. It was goodbye for the last time. The next morning, Shisui's body was found in the river, apparently from suicide, and Itaka was immediately a suspect. I wasn't home when the police came to investigate, but Suzuki told me about it later in hushed, worried tones. I couldn't recall Itaki ever striking anyone in anger before, at least not while at home. In fact, aside from the confrontation with the genin who had hurt me, I couldn't recall ever seeing him truly angry at all. Frustrated. Occasionally. Annoyed. Sure. Furious enough to attack members of our family. Never. I found him sitting on the veranda staring off into space. His sword was propped on the railing beside him within easy reach should he need it. I hesitated for only a moment before padding over and sitting at his side. He didn't react, didn't look up or acknowledge me in any way. I slipped my arm around him in a hug, but his body was as stiff as stone, and he did not allow me to wiggle under his arm as I'd done so many times before. Instead, I settled for resting my cheek on his bicep. He didn't cry this time, but I didn't really expect him to. Whatever you feel, whatever you're going through, I'm here, I said, holding him tighter. Even if you feel like you can't talk about it, I'm still here. He did not react. With Shisui's death, could he see the truth? With his Manjikyo Sherinan, could he finally see what he would be forced to do? It wasn't your fault, I said. He flinched, just a small movement, something I would not have felt if I didn't have my arms wrapped around him. It wasn't his fault. He hadn't known. Shisui was so strong. He couldn't have known. But I did. I'd known. And I'd done nothing. But you're still here, I said. For now. But not for long. In a few months he would kill the entire clan. Everyone but Suzuki. And then he would join the Akatsuki and live as a criminal, waiting for the day Suzuki would finally grow strong enough to kill him. And then he would die. My eyes were stinging, and I blinked rapidly. It didn't help. I'm glad you're still here. You're my Unii Chan, and I love you. And Nii Chan loves you too. And we still need you. So please, don't die. Don't, you have to. Itaka was a child whose closest friend had been murdered. Shisui had died before his eyes, and Itaka was being crushed under the weight of stopping a coup, preventing civil war, and protecting what he cared about most. I was the adult who would soon be free of it all. I should have been the strong one. So why couldn't I stop crying? Hesitantly, Itaki raised his hand to drape over my shoulder. It lingered there, an almost hug, but he shrugged me off when it became obvious that I wasn't going anywhere on my own. I have to go, he said, his tone as empty as his eyes. And he left me there. Nothing I did mattered. I couldn't change anything. How long will you be gone this time? I asked Itaka, who was cleaning his gear on the veranda just after dawn while the rest of the family still slept. He might have been doing it for convenience and quiet, or he might have been avoiding us. His expression was withdrawn, almost melancholy, so I wiggled in under his arm and gave him a hug. This time he allowed it. Just a few days, he said quietly. A quick glance at his pack showed food pills, weapons, and other ninja tools, but there were no camping supplies, which was a good sign. It meant he would have a bed and a roof over his head at least. Compared to most of his missions, that was quite luxurious. I held out a cloth-wrapped bundle and he raised a questioning eyebrow. I made you lunch, I said shyly. Umbu generally subsisted on food pills for the duration of their missions because stealth was a requirement. They couldn't light fires or eat anything with a strong scent that might give away their position to a ninja with enhanced senses. They also traveled light, cutting down the weight of their gear and counting ounces that might slow them down. As such, they needed food that was light, calorie dense, and nutrient rich. I tasted food pills once, and I couldn't imagine having to live on those for weeks at a time. 
It was like eating little balls of nutritious mud. It's angry with seaweed and some dango and some devaku, I clarified when he didn't reach for it immediately. I'd also included a note inside that read do your best, Ani I Chan. I believe in you. It was a meaningless gesture, but despite all of the praise he regularly received, Itaki had never been given the tiniest hint of emotional support by Fugaku or Mikato or, well, anyone else for that matter. It was, perhaps, foolish to think that he needed it, to think that reaching out in this way would be seen as anything but a childish whim on my part. But no matter how often I reminded myself that nothing I did mattered, I couldn't stop from trying just a little bit. He took the lunch. Thank you, Kiyo-chan, he said. I have to go now. Bye, Ani-chan, I said. Come home safe. He raised his hand in a half wave and then vanished in a body flicker. I made sure to pack Itaki a single lunch before each mission. It wasn't much, especially when he was gone for a week or more at a time, but it was something. And I always included a special note, making an effort to include something positive and encouraging each time. It wasn't much, but I liked to think it helped. A few months later, Fugaku took Suzuki down to the lake, and I thought I knew why when they both returned looking less than pleased. Things had been tense at home ever since Shisui's death. Itaka disappeared on missions even more frequently than usual. Considering how often he'd been gone before, that was saying something. Fugaku had also grown even colder and more distant. He'd never been a happy, cheerful man. With the responsibility of looking after a furious clan and fending off a suspicious village, I couldn't really blame him, but it had been weeks since I'd seen him smile and months since I'd heard anything resembling a kind word. Sure enough, when Suzuki returned, he told me about his failed attempt to learn the clan's signature fireball jutsu. It was a technique all Uchiha were required to learn before they would be accepted as adults of the clan. I thought he was a little young to be learning the coming of age right, but I'd come to accept was that Fugaku had very little regard for what was and was not reasonable development for his children. What confused me was the fact that I had not been invited to the lake as well. But Fugaku only scowled and explained that the fireball technique could put great strain on the user's lungs. I would probably never be able to learn it. Yet. Yeah. Fair. After dinner, Suzuki sat with me on the veranda looking dejected. Nii Chan. I asked hesitantly. I just wanted. He trailed off. All of Suzuki's goals, all of his training was centered on making Fugaku proud. He shook his head and squared his shoulders. I'm going to keep training, Kiyo Chan. I'll get it right. I'm just getting started. I couldn't fault his determination. That was for certain. I know you will, I said because I already knew he could do it. Suzuki returned to the lake every day after class, and by the end of the week, he dragged Fugaku down to the lake and demonstrated his progress. I followed. Fugaku was still cold, but I thought I detected a hint of surprise when Suzuki succeeded. He'd been so sure that Suzuki wasn't ready. Fugaku said nothing, turning away and walking slowly down the dock. Suzuki's face fell again with confusion and hurt. Surely this was enough. Why wasn't it enough? But Fugaku stopped, his back still turned to Suzuki. Now then, that's my boy, he said. You have done well. Work hard and you're bound to soar high and bring honor to the crest you wear on your back. Seeing Suzuki's smile was like watching the sun rise. I will, he said. Of course he would. It was all he'd ever wanted. From now on, walk your own path not in the footsteps of Itaki, said Fugaku, looking back at Suzuki briefly before continuing on his way. What? Suzuki asked when Fugaku was out of earshot. Not in Nii-san's footsteps? But I thought. He thought that Fugaku wanted another attack here. Ani-chan has been sad since Shisui Nii-san died, I said. I think Tio-yu-chan doesn't understand. 
as if it was a simple misunderstanding and not a fundamental schism with their ideologies. But it wasn't entirely inaccurate either. No, I think it was before that, said Suzuki, frowning. I woke up to them shouting one night. Nii-san didn't want to go to a meeting. And then after Shisui died, the police came to ask him about it. I think Tio Yu-chan puts a lot of pressure on Unii chan too, I said. And wasn't that an understatement? Shisui Nii-san was his best friend. Unii chan must be in a lot of pain. Yeah, Nii-san said that there were downsides to being powerful too, said Suzuki, looking up. He said that power makes people arrogant and isolated. He said that he was a wall for me to overcome, even if I were to hate him. So, he'd made his decision then. I wondered when the point of no return had been crossed. Perhaps it had been with Shisui's death, the moment when Itaka knew that all other paths had been closed to him. Is there anything we can do? Nothing. Nothing at all. I don't know, I said, and I left it at that. Chapter 9, The Night Itaka's birthday came and went while he was on a mission, and suddenly he was 13 years old. I hadn't been sure of what to get him for this birthday. This was the last gift I would ever give him, so I wanted it to mean something. Due to the tension between him and the rest of our family, Itaka didn't have a party when he finally returned two weeks later looking empty and tired. He'd come in during the night, and at dawn he was preparing to head out again. I gave him his present as he was putting on his shoes, moving slowly and deliberately like an old man. The gift was a necklace with three tomo spaced evenly along the chain. I had written Itaka, Suzuki, and Kiyo on each of the tomo with Mikato's help so that the names could only be seen by someone with a sherry non. It's so we're always together even when we're not, I said. Itaka, his eyes red with the sherry non, ran his thumb over my name, though his expression did not change. Do you like it? Yes, he said softly. He put it on with our names facing inward and hidden by his high collar. Well, he was an umbu, so it probably wasn't a good idea to have his name on display even if it could only be read by an Uchiha, or Kakashi, I supposed. He stood up. How long will you be gone this time? I asked, holding out his lunch with the little note tucked inside as usual. He did not reach up to take it. Nor did he answer right away. Not long, he said at last. He wouldn't look at me. And I knew. It was the same feeling I'd had with Shisui. Tonight the entire clan would die. Do you have to go? I asked, a weak ploy for time, more time. There wasn't enough time. You haven't celebrated your birthday yet, right? You should spend time with the people who love you. I have to go, he said, and he took a step. This was the end. W wait, I said. I half expected him to ignore me, but he paused in the doorway, not turning back but not leaving either. I took the two steps required to stand beside him, and I pushed his lunch into his hand. I know that things have been really bad lately. I think, I think maybe a part of that is because we, all of us, don't talk as much as we should. Tio Yu Chan is proud of you and Nii Chan. And he loves you even if he doesn't say it. Kaya Chan loves us all and wants us to be happy. Nii Chan admires you and wants to stand beside you. And I know that you love us more than anything even if you can't say it anymore. Itaka did not speak, his hand still braced against the door, a silhouette against the morning light. No matter what, we'll always be a family, I said. Ever since Shisui and I I said. I stopped and swallowed thickly. I know you've been hurting. And I'm sorry I couldn't help. I'm sorry I couldn't do anything. I'm sorry I couldn't make it better. I know that something bad is coming, and I can't tell you what to do. I just want you to know that I want you to be okay. Whatever you have to do, even if it's bad, I forgive you. No matter what you decide, you're my Ani-chan, and I will love you forever. 
he'd said the same thing to Suzuki before his final death, but I thought that maybe he needed to hear it too. I wrapped my arms around his middle, giving him a hug for the very last time. He still did not turn, did not move to embrace me or to push me away. Thank you, he said. And then he was gone. I thought about spending the day with Mikato, sitting on the veranda wrapped in blankets and reading Kumi Kunoichi. I thought about maybe going to visit the Uchiha park where the younger kids were playing games of ninja. I thought about telling Fugaku what would happen, telling the police, telling the Hokage, telling anyone. But it wouldn't do any good. Fugaku had been willing to accept his death to protect Suzuki. The police had fallen without landing a single blow on either Itaki or Obito. The Hokage would do nothing. Nothing at all. I thought about a lot of things, so many things that Mikato came to get me, saying that I would be late for school. School. I'd almost forgotten. Suzuki was standing impatiently at the door with both of our lunches in his hands. Mikato was in the kitchen doing the dishes, and Fugaku sat at the table with a cup of tea. I should have come in earlier. I needed to say goodbye. But there was no time. I threw my arms around Mikato. I love you, Ka-chan, I said. My, my, what's this about? Mikato asked. I shook my head because what could I say? She too had been willing to die in the end. Sorry, I had a bad dream, I said. I just wanted to say it. That's all. Well, it was just a nightmare, said Mikato, patting my hair and you need to get to school before you're late. I didn't want to let go. But holding on wouldn't change a thing. I gave Fugaku a hug and told him that I loved him too. He looked briefly uncomfortable, like he wasn't totally sure how to handle this earnest display of affection. Maybe I hadn't said it often enough. Maybe I should have tried harder to reach him. It was too late now. I grabbed a piece of toast, and I ran out the door with Suzuki. Goodbye Kaya-chan, Tio-yu-chan, I called. I love you. Fugaku and Mikato smiled at me as I ran after Suzuki. School passed in a blur. At lunch, Suzuki bumped my shoulder. Hey, are you okay? He asked, frowning. I smiled, and it felt weak. Just a little tired, I said because of the bad dream? Suzuki asked. I nodded. Sure, let's go with that. Suzuki took my hand and pulled me over to a shaded tree. We sat together, and I leaned against his shoulder as he ate. Nii-chan. I asked. He hummed. You're really going to be a great ninja one day. It was the same thing I'd been telling him for most of my life but I still wanted him to hear it again. One last time. Like Nii-san, he said. No, I said. Like you. You're not the same as Unii-chan. He understands everything right away and races ahead so fast that he can't always see how hard everyone else works. But you earn your strength through determination and practice. And I think that maybe that's better because you understand just how much it takes to become strong. I don't see how that helps, said Suzuki. When you make a friend, you'll be able to understand them, I said. Unii-chan never could, and I think that's why he was so lonely. I don't ever want you to be lonely. Suzuki leaned back against the tree. I don't need friends, he said. I have you and Nii-san. But, I guess if I ever do make a friend, it might be nice. You will? I said, absolutely certain. The best friend of them all. Across the yard, Naruto was eating a cold cup of instant ramen. I really shouldn't. Oh, what did it matter? I, I think Naruto would be a good friend, I said. Huh? Suzuki asked. Why Naruto? He seems very lonely, and... I began, but then I paused. I'd steadfastly avoided talking about the incident, but it didn't matter now. It might even be enough for Suzuki to give Naruto a chance. 
And, well, a long time ago, back when I first met Naruto, a boy came up to me and demanded that I be his girlfriend. I told him no, and the next day he brought his older brother, a genin, to, well. I cleared my throat. Naruto stood up for me. Naruto was hurt because I'd been foolish. He'd fought for a girl he didn't even know because he was the type of person who would always stand up for what was right. Naruto is a good person, I said. That's why I really want us all to be friends. Hopefully that would be enough. Well, okay, I guess, said Suzuki. He's still annoying, though. The bell rang, and the teachers called us in. Suzuki was slightly more civil with Naruto during afternoon Taijutsu class, so I considered that a win. I thought about spending the afternoon together, just the three of us, but Daikoku held out his hand in front of Suzuki just after class. Wait a minute, Suzuki-kun, said Daikoku as we went to leave. He waited until everyone else had filtered out before continuing. Because of your outstanding shuriken and kunao techniques, you've been selected for a special training session to help improve your skill. Achinin appeared in the doorway. He might have seemed ordinary except for the fact that his face was unervingly blank and I couldn't sense him at all. Umbu. So they wanted to make sure that Suzuki wouldn't be home until attack it was finished. Oh, um, can I come along to watch? I asked. This training is for Suzuki-kun, said the Chinin. Only Suzuki-kun. I hadn't even realized that I'd been nurturing a small seed of hope. But I still felt it when it died. I swallowed whatever I emotions rose up in that moment and gave Suzuki my brightest smile. Oh, okay, do your best, Nii-chan, I said. If this was our last goodbye, I wanted it to be a happy one. I tried to say more, but no words came. I had so much I wanted to say. So why? Yeah, said Suzuki. I'll see you later, Kiyo-chan. Wait. But Daikoku and the Chinin were ushering him away, speaking loudly about the training agenda. Suzuki. Nii-chan. I mumbled, barely more than a whisper, as he rounded the corner and vanished from my sight. Please don't leave me. I love you. Goodbye. But he was already gone. I stood for a moment longer before turning slowly and walking away. There was still one thing left for me to do. I closed my eyes and reached out my senses. It didn't take long, and I made a beeline to the academy park. I found him on a swing with his head bowed and his blonde fringe obscuring his eyes. Hey, Naruto, I said. He looked up in surprise at my approach, his eyes oddly bright. I, wanted to talk to you. Oh, hi, Kiyo-chan, he said, blinking. What did you want to talk about? If I wanted to, I could tell him everything. And really, what would it matter if I did? What was the hokage going to do? Kill me? But Naruto was only seven. It wasn't fair to unload the weight of the future onto him when he was still just a child. Soon he would have to bear the burden of the entire world. But not now. Not yet. There was, however, one thing I had to say. I just want you to know that I think, I think you're really cool. I said, the words tumbling out before I could think better of them. Eh. Naruto asked his face such a perfect picture of shock that it erased my momentary embarrassment. Wait, really? Why? Do you remember when we first met? I asked. You protected me. Oh, that, he said, looking down. Well, I didn't really. True, but... You did your best, I said, kneeling down in the grass beside him. Naruto's eyes were filled with surprise and maybe a little bit of hope. You were so brave to stand up to him and so kind to protect someone you'd just met. To me, that makes you a really cool guy. Even if other people don't always see it, I wanted you to know. You you really? Naruto trailed off, the brightness in his eyes beating at the edge of his lashes. 
and I wondered how rarely he heard kind words that mine had such an effect. Yeah, I said. I'm sorry it took me so long to tell you. And I was. I'd been so focused on trying not to make things worse that I hadn't managed to make anything better either. Naruto rubbed his eyes, dispelling the tears before they could fall and giving me a painfully wide grin. Eh yeah, that's okay, he said. Do you, want to play ninja with me? Yeah, I said. Let's play ninja. We played for hours, our game traversing several parks, an unused training ground, and many back allies. Naruto was, really good, actually. Because there were only two of us, we kept to the hide and seek aspect of the game. Naruto wasn't always fast, but he had a knack for tracking me down, and it was only my innate chakra sense that allowed me to find him when he really wanted to hide. I didn't normally enjoy games of ninja, but with Naruto it was different. For the first time in a long while, I felt all of my worries and fears melt away. And as afternoon faded to evening, we climbed to the top of the Hokage Monument together so that we could look out over all of Kanaha as the sun began to set. I've never been up here before, I admitted, admiring the view. Huh, really? Naruto asked sitting with his legs dangling precariously over the edge. Someone really should install a railing. I come up here all the time. I can see why, I said. It's beautiful. Off in the distance, I could see the lights of the Uchiha district. It was almost time now. I thought briefly about running away as far and fast as my legs could carry me. But there was no running from this. If I tried, Itaka would hunt me down. And if he didn't, Danzo would. My skills were good for an academy student, but they were still nothing compared to an actual ninja. It was like Itaki had said. We had nowhere else to go. Naruto. I began, but I stopped. Did you have fun today? Huh, oh, yeah. Said Naruto. It was the best, Databia. Hey, did you have fun? In this world of ninja, filled with darkness and pain, Naruto shone like the sun. Yeah, I said. It was fun. Um, hey, Kiyo-chan. Said Naruto, his enthusiasm suddenly replaced by uncertainty. Does this mean we're F friends? I hesitated. Which was worse? To have a friend and lose them in just one day? Or to have no friends at all? Yeah, I said. We're friends. And maybe you can be friends with Nii Chan too. We can, we can all be friends together. If you thought today was good, the future will be even better. Because you know what's better than having a friend. Having lots of friends. And I know that one day you'll have lots and lots of friends who see you the way I do. Do you really think so? Naruto asked, and I couldn't quite name the look that spread across his face, a mix of hope and longing. I know so, I said, standing up. But it's getting late, and I have to go. Oh, okay, I guess, said Naruto. For a moment he looked dejected, but then his face lit up. Well, see you tomorrow, Kiyo-chan. I nodded, unable to speak. Unable to lie. It was just past dusk when I returned to the too quiet Uchiha district. I stretched out my senses, but all of the buildings were empty. I couldn't feel anyone at all. Or, no. Itaka was at home. I ran toward him, past the weapons puncturing the walls, past the blood, past Tiaki and Urushi, dead in front of their little senbei shop. I arrived home, and it was as dark and silent as the rest of the Uchiha district. I traced Itaka's chakra to the dojo and reached up to open the doors. I'd known what I would see. I'd been preparing for it for over seven years. I'd said goodbye this morning knowing what I would find when I returned. And yet. Mikato. Fugaku. Mom. Dad. They were. Red. He had killed them quickly, almost painlessly. 
but seeing their lifeless bodies laid out like that made time stand still. A figure moved in the shadows. Itaka made no effort to conceal his presence, merely stepping into the moonlight and looking at me with dispassionate eyes. Eyes red with the sherry non. Whatever words I'd intended to say caught in my throat. Whatever I'd been planning vanished as I saw his katana dripping red with blood. His eyes met mine, and they swirled into a three-pointed pinwheel. Tsukuyomi. And I. Woke up. I blinked and was out of bed in an instant. There was sunlight outside, birds chirping, and the sounds of our neighbors in the street. Kiyo-chan. Mikato called from downstairs. Hurry or you're going to be late for school. This wasn't, it couldn't be. I tiptoed downstairs to find everyone, including Itaki, sitting at the breakfast table. He looked over at me and smiled. It was an easy expression, one I hadn't seen for the better part of a year. I felt like someone had punched me in the gut. Are you all right, Kiyo-chan? He asked. You didn't have a bad dream, did you? Bad dream? Bad dream? Why yeah, I mumbled. Let me, get dressed. I did so slowly and carefully, trying to feel the difference between the genjutsu and reality. I tried all the usual tricks including flaring my chakra and inflicting pain, but nothing helped. Of course it wouldn't. Tsukuyomi was not so easily undone. I came downstairs again, and I threw my arms around Mikato just as I had that morning. She smelled faintly of her perfumed soap. Ninja rarely used scented products. They could be a liability in the field when so many ninja had enhanced senses of smell. But Mikato had been retired for longer than I'd been alive, so she could indulge in it. It felt real. She felt real. Mikato patted my hair and gave me a warm hug, not even asking why I was being so clingy. Why don't I walk you to school today? Itaki asked, still smiling gently. After a moment, I nodded. I grabbed a piece of toast, and we began walking together. Ani I chan, why am I here? I asked hesitantly. Itaka gave me a puzzled look, but I knew it was him and not just a construct like the others. What do you mean? He asked. The clan was planning to betray the village, weren't they? I asked. And to protect Kanaha, you had to stop them. So, why, all this? I waved my hand at the world around me. This wasn't a torture genjutsu like he would use on Suzuki. Here, you are safe, he said. He paused and looked at the sky, a perfect sunny day. Isn't it better this way? Oh. In Tsukuyomi, time and space were attackers to command. If he wanted, he could stretch a single moment into an entire lifetime. A perfect lifetime free of death and free of pain. I could grow old and die here after a long and happy life. It's not real, I said, but it was a token resistance. If the illusion felt real, the body made it real. Of all the ways to die, this was probably the most merciful. I know, he said. I'm sorry I couldn't give you this reality. We continued walking. Time was strange within Tsukuyomi. If I focused, it seemed to pass just the same as time in the real world, but if I lost focus, time blurred together. I could blink and another few weeks were suddenly gone with only vague memories of what I'd been doing. Life happened in snapshots. Suzuki and I made friends at the academy. Suzuki graduated at the top of his class and was put on a team with Hineda and Kiba. It was both a surprise and not because Itaka didn't know the future. He didn't know what should have been, what would be in the real world. He could only take what he knew now and attempt to extrapolate from that. Of course he would make mistakes, fudge details, and fill in the blanks with his own ideas. I graduated and was immediately recruited by the hospital. I was an intern, a resident, a medic. Suzuki was a genin, a chinin, a jounin. There was no escape. There had never been an escape. I let my mind drift, and grew older. 
I moved out of the house and into an apartment near the hospital. Itaki and Suzuki threw me a housewarming party, and half a dozen of my closest friends came too. One of them, a girl named Akane, introduced me to her teammate, a boy who promptly asked me out on a date. He was strong and handsome and kind. He was perfect, frighteningly perfect, more like the caricature of a love interest than an actual person. And I realized that Itaki, my 13-year-old brother, was trying to give me a boyfriend, which was mortifying. I turned down the boy, and I turned down the next one that came after. Itaka tried again and again, apparently convinced that all girls wanted to get married and start families. After his eighth failed attempt, he even tentatively offered me a girlfriend, which was both mortifying and hilarious. Eventually Itaki asked me outright what I wanted, and I told him that the only thing I wanted was a place of my own, a house surrounded by trees with a big garden and large windows to let in lots of air and sunshine. He accepted this, albeit slightly dubiously, and that was the end of that. Itaka married Izumi, and they had three children. Suzuki married Akane, and they had five children. Their children grew up, and I played the part of friendly, candy-giving aunt. Itaka became the fifth Hokage, and the village was at peace. There were no whispers of the Akatsuki, Zetsu, or Madara. There was no fourth Shinobi War, and the Atsutsuki clan did not descend from the heavens. Kagaya's revival remained a distant fantasy. Itaka sent me on missions all across the elemental nations. I stood on mountain tops and swam in the ocean. I saw forests and deserts and plains, everything in every travel guide I'd ever read. Time slipped away faster. I was 30, 40, 50. My nieces and nephews moved out and became fine police officers. I was a respected member of the hospital. Suzuki took over Fugaku's role as the chief of police when Fugaku retired. He and Mikato passed away a few years later, quietly and without pain. I was 60, 70, 80. I was old and white-haired. I was tired. Itaka, his hair also snowy white and his face wrinkled with age, sat beside my hospital bed. Suzuki and all of my nieces and nephews had come in to see me earlier, but now it was just the two of us. How are you feeling? He asked, and for once I didn't have to focus to feel as if I was living in the moment. I'm fine, Ani I chan I said. I'd never grown out of using his childish title. I'm just a little tired. Then sleep, he said. I wondered if he was feeling doubt over his choice now that we were near the end. I knew why he had done it. He had only been allowed to spare his younger brother. Other innocents, all of the other children of the clan, had already fallen to his blade. It wasn't that Itaka didn't love me. Of course he did. But he loved me the same way he loved Fugaku, Mikato, and Izumi. He loved me and the rest of our family. Itaka reached out to hold my wrinkled hand, and he smiled at me. If I go to sleep now, I might not wake. I said. I was so tired. For just a moment, Itaka's face twisted in grief before he composed himself once more. I hadn't meant to hurt him. I hadn't meant for many things to happen. How was it that I had been given years to make things right and still managed to reach the end with so many regrets? Kiyo-chan, do you, are you truly ready to die? He asked. Even after everything he'd done, he still wanted permission, to wait until I was prepared. I looked up at the ceiling and thought of the life he'd given me, of the peace and friendship that would never exist in the real world. I died young in my previous life. And I would die younger in this one. But he gave me the illusion of time and the story of a life. He hadn't needed to, but he'd done it anyway as a final gift, one that was winding down even now. I gave his hand a little squeeze. I'd been preparing for this day for a very, very long time. I was as ready as I would ever be. No one is ever really ready to die, I said. But I know why you have to kill me, Ani I chan I knew that there was something going on with the clan, 
and Nii Chan would be in danger if he ever knew. I don't ever want either of you to be hurt because of me, and I know you could never kill him. So, please go easy on him. He's just a little kid, and he doesn't know anything. He'll be in a lot of pain once it's over. Just don't make it any harder than it has to be. Itaka's face twisted again into a picture of agony. You dash, he began, but then he stopped, lowering his head until his bangs hid his eyes from view. His shoulders shook. Oh, I said, something occurring to me as the room started to dim. Have you seen my ribbon? I must have lost it somewhere. It's here, said Itaka, producing my simple blue ribbon from an inner pocket. Even in the illusion, his face was wet with tears. Would you like me to help you put it on? I nodded, and he helped me sit up. He ran his fingers through my hair, pulling back my fringe and tying the ribbon into a bow just as I had always done as a child. I settled back down slowly and carefully onto pillows as soft as heaven. What I told you before is still true, I said. I forgive you, and I will love you forever. You'll always be my Ani I Chan. Itaka leaned forward to kiss my forehead and spoke words nearly too soft to hear. I closed my eyes. My breathing slowed, becoming heavier as I drifted off, slipping away quietly while Itaki held my hand. I was so tired. I breathed once, in and out. And I slept. The end. And, that's the end of this part. Let me know what you thought about this story in the comments down below. I know the ending is quite sad, and initially the writer of this story, Safria, thought of ending it here, which honestly isn't that bad of an ending. I haven't read anything remotely close to this absolute banger, in terms of ending at least. But the author due to the fan's requests, decided to create an alternate ending to the story, and thus the story still continues. So just smash that like button, cause this one definitely deserves that much at the very least, and subscribe so you never miss out on these contents. See you in the next one.